candles, um, and then there's the clean beauty, of course, which we're really proud of that whole section and what we'll be able to, I don't know, contribute to the clean beauty movement. And so there's always something for everybody here in the store. I didn't realize how long this has been brewing in your head. Mm -hmm. The newsletter's 2008, the company comes a few years later, but sort of at the height of your Hollywood powers 20 years ago, mm -hmm. you were already thinking about something else. Where did that start for you? Well, I think I've always, um, I've always been a person that's been incredibly curious and always wanted to learn. And, and that to me is also like learning where the best bagel shop in Sag Harbor is and kind of gathering good information and sharing good information. It's always been my real passion. And I've always been like a pretty discerning customer. So I remember when the internet was kind of first getting going, I couldn't really find anything in the lifestyle space that spoke to me as a customer. And, you know, I didn't trust the travel curations, for example. And so I thought, gosh, it would be so fun to have a site on the internet that kind of had uh, a collection or an aggregation or a curation of really the things that make me excited. So it took me a long time of talking to people, meeting with people, asking questions, even before I just decided to send that very first simple newsletter. It was a good few years in the making. And as you thought about it then, was that sort of, this is my next chapter after acting, or is this a parallel chapter with acting? I describe it as like, I'm in my life and I'm doing my thing, but there's some part of me that's preparing for something else <laughs> in my future. And I don't think I was consciously thinking about a next chapter, but I think I was definitely thinking about, um, you know, the years that I had spent doing three, four, five movies a year, traveling all the time, missing my home, missing my friends and family, um, and also wondering, you know, do I have permission to ask, even ask the question, like, do I, would I want to do something else? Like, would I have the liberty to pursue a different passion? And how, what would that look like? And and so it was a slow process for me. It definitely was like a leap that I was taking. When you started writing the newsletter, mm -hmm. at what point along that journey did you say, oh, this can be something more? Maybe there's a company in there yeah. somewhere. Yeah, I think, you know, well, I remember a specific moment when um, I had done a piece on the French pharmacies. So the pharmacies in France are fantastic and they have all these amazing products. I kind of had done an edit of the best of the French pharmacy and somebody stopped me on the street and said, you know, I love that piece so much. I just wish I could have clicked to buy at the end because I was on, you know, amazon.fr trying to find this and that and it was such a nightmare. And I, it was the first time that it occurred have e-commerce as a service as opposed to just being so transactional, like buy this, buy this, like that a curation was actually valuable and information and someone like going out and doing all the legwork for you could actually be a value proposition. And so that's when I started to think about how e-commerce might, might play into this. Did you have people in your life saying, this is nice, Gwyneth, that you're doing pretty well with the acting thing. Let's, let's keep our focus here. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, not in my immediate life because I think my family and my friends, I think they're used to my, I think what was always a really entrepreneurial spirit, right? I mean, I think when you're an artist, it's very entrepreneurial. You have to believe in yourself so much when nobody else believes in you and you have to visualize that you're going to get somewhere and it's, it's, so there are a lot of parallels, I think. Um, but definitely, you know, people not closest to me were like, you know, what the hell is she doing? <laughs> Why is she doing this? And um, which, you know, it's like the story of my life. How did you bump up against those skeptics and, yeah. and deal with some of that criticism? And like being my own worst skeptic in that capacity, right? Not knowing yeah. if I had the ability to run a company and, um, and really having to learn on the fly how to run a company and making so many mistakes, you know, because I hadn't grown up in the world of e-commerce or growth marketing or anything, you know, I had just, I just had passion and an instinct and like, I thought, you know, good taste. And, um, and so I, I set out to do it and I didn't, I didn't set out to run it. When I first 
started to think about how to monetize it. I thought somebody else, you know, has to do this. So I hired a CEO, a great guy named Seb, who was my first CEO in London. And unfortunately, when I was moving to America, he couldn't move. He was going to come. And it, it, over the next couple of years, I realized like that certainly at the size we were, that I was the right person to run the company. And despite the myriad mistakes that I've made, I still think that that was the right decision up to a point. I mean, you know, I think at a certain point, it's going to be too much for me and I'll hand the, hand the keys to somebody else. But you've got the company this far. Mm -hmm. You've done pretty well with it. <laughs> you don't think you could take it to the next level? Well, it's, it's hard for me to gauge because I, I, I know what I have not known from zero to where we are now, and I don't know what I don't know from now mm. into like the next phase. And so, I mean, I ask questions all the time. I call other founders all the time. What should I anticipate? Like, what's around the corner? What? How do you really scale after this? You know, point. And I think that I could probably do it to a certain point, but I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure if I could run it, you know, like if, you know, if we were, had a even more complex international omni-channel business, like I just don't know that I would be the right person at that point. You're in every meeting, you're making all the decisions. Was that a hard adjustment for you where, oh my gosh, this is all coming back to me at the end? Yeah, for sure. And a scary one. Um, I think when you work at a company like Goop, you you have to assemble a great team around you and, and really, you know, I think the team that we have is amazing and we make decisions collectively, but the buck always stops with me. And I would say it is difficult to be the creative force, the driving force creatively and to have all these ideas all the time, but also to be the person who's responsible for the P&L. Sometimes those are competing intentions. Yeah. And so it's been, it's been very interesting for me to learn how to adjudicate those things and understand like when it's okay to take a risk and when it's not. And I mean, you never know 100%. I know that as fun and invigorating as it is, there are some really tough days and there are moments where you're like, actually, I'm not sure if this is gonna work. I don't know if we're yes. gonna get there. Yeah. Did you have several of those moments before you got to this point? I have them all the time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course. And especially like having gotten through a pandemic and now there's a looming recession and it's always something and you think like, you know, is this going to be okay? Do, do I have the chops to get us through this? Like, what am I not thinking about? What else, you know, is like, what are the potential landmines? Um, and it's funny, I saw something once that said, you know, it's like the creative process and it was like someone ideating or having an idea and it was like, this is brilliant. I am brilliant. I think this is okay. Like, I don't think this is okay. This is <laughs> I am <laughs> And then it starts again, you know, it's like, and that's very true. And I think that's just part of the, the seasons of, you know, being a founder and being so close to what you're doing and having to get excited by your own ideas, which is so weird. And then sometimes you think like, this is terrible. Like, why am I doing this? Like, you know, but I'm it out. passes. <laughs> yes, I've had many of those days. But then the next day is a good day and you're, you're right back at it, right? Yeah. Or the next day, you know, someone, you know, says like, you know, I had a conversation with my daughter about her sexual wellness that I never thought possible. And you facilitated that. And I'm so grateful because I grew up with all this weird shame around it. And now, you know, and she cited goop, like things like that happen. And it like makes me cry. Or someone says, you know, I found the best restaurant I ever went to and, you know, on your thing. And I met some, you know, it's like those, that, that web of meaning that happens when I think you're creating a business from a place of really wanting to help people find great things and, you know, bring them shortcuts and, and bring them amazing quality products, like that happens. So those things always fill me back up and make me think like, okay, I, you know, I'm gonna keep going. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Don Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app.
live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Let's talk about some of those amazing products. Okay. Some of the ones that get the most attention. Yes. The candle on top there. Mm hmm Tell me the story behind the candle, the one that everyone talks about. Yes, I will. We really believe at Goop that um, there are a bunch of taboos that exist that keep women particularly kind of ensconced in shame and out of their power. And so we like to find those paradigms and expose them. The This smells like my vagina. Can I say that on yeah, morning TV? Absolutely. Okay, good. So see, we've made yeah, progress. We we've made progress. It's a this right is here. great. So that so they're really they're really provocations right. more than candles. They're meant to sort of take people by surprise and then ask like what is this? What does this mean? And this is like triggering and why is it triggering? And I think there's a lot of it's certainly when I grew up, there was a lot of shame around our sexuality um, or ambition. And so the This Smells Like My Vagina candle is really like that provocation to say like, it's amazing to be a woman in every way. It's amazing to have that kind of power and you deserve to have that agency. And so it's just kind of a funny, strong way of, you know, being a provocateur. And you guys have a big focus on pleasure, which I feel like... Yeah even lately, partly because of you guys, people talk about that more yeah, openly. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's a conversation that we started around that very thing, right? Like, what is it like to be a woman who is not afraid of orienting around pleasure? That's It's not selfish. It's beautiful. It's important. You know, whether it doesn't have to be sexual pleasure, but just this idea that, you know, we all deserve pleasure and it's a beautiful part of life, right? And so the sexual piece of that you know, sexual wellness is a really new vertical, both at Goop and I think in, in culturally. So I think we're really proud of what we've been able to do culturally and shake that taboo off a bit. So what do you see, whether it's with you at the helm or not, what do you see next for Goop? Well, I think we still, you know, we have a lot of work to do. I think just again, like having been a startup and made a lot of mistakes, like we're, we're in a really interesting foundational year of like cleaning up a bunch of processes. And I think we, we really are excited to keep kind of introducing the brand to people who might not know about the brand yet. I think that the, the lifestyle aspect is exciting to me as well. You know, that there are multiple ways that you can reach a customer. We just, we, we started a food business that's very nascent yeah. in Los Angeles that's doing extremely well, but I think it's a great way to deliver on the beauty and wellness from a different angle, right? We're always just trying to push further um, and think about the different ways that we can connect with the customer and think about, you know, the exciting products that we have in the pipeline. And there's a lot still left to do. I'm very proud of us and how, where we've been able to get to. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. 
news is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Do you ever look back, Gwyneth, and say, I left behind, not completely, obviously, but I left behind an incredibly successful <laughs> acting career. Do you miss that part of your life to be on sets all the time and traveling and doing all those things? No, I don't. I really don't miss it at all. I think I'm so lucky that I got to do it and I still, I'm sure I still will at some point. You know, I did promise my mother that at some point, like if we ever sell the company or if I am not CEO or at some point before I die, I told her that I would go and, you know, do a play. So I'm going to stick, I'm going to, I'm okay. going to deliver on that promise at some point. Okay. When I'm, Get you on Broadway, yes, West End. Yes, that's something. what she would like. Okay. So, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> you also, what a gift to be able to have this period in your life with your kids, which I know was yeah. intentional. Has that been maybe even the best part of all this, that you haven't been flying all over the world, that you've been home with the kids? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, especially now that I do have one going off to college, you realize how finite, it just, it went so quickly. And you're right, you know, I used to be, I was, I was talking to my son about this the other day, actually, that I used to be in, I used to take him and his friends in London to a kickboxing class every Wednesday. And I would be editing the newsletter on my iPad because it would go out, you know, Thursday morning. And but I was always there. I was always in this basement in Swiss Cottage in England, you know, like yeah. at the kickboxing. And so I was, I was able to be there for most of it, which I really appreciate because, I mean, being on set is amazing, but the hours are long. I mean, you know, sometimes 18 hours. So there were certain times when, when I did do movies, when I had them and I, you know, I would leave the house before they woke up and I would come home after they were already asleep. And that was tough. So I feel very blessed that I've been able to try to pursue this other career and kind of like keep hours, you know, where I'm, I'm able to be home and make them dinner and stuff like that. I was interested to hear you say in another interview that you're almost more comfortable doing this than you were doing movies. You seem so at ease as an actor and you did so well with it. <laughs> But you've sort of said, despite you know your parents being in the business, it didn't really feel like home to you. You yeah. didn't love the fame that came with it and all that. What did you mean when you said that? Well, I think it's a few things. I mean, and it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? Because fame is also incredible and brings with it amazing things and opportunities. And I was able to leverage that to start Goop, and you know I still do in, in a lot of ways. Um, but I think. You know, having done now in my corporate life, like having done Myers Briggs a couple times, like I'm an introvert. I always really? test, yes. And so I'm sort of a fake extrovert who's had to get comfortable being, like pretending to be an extrovert, and I'm really not. So I don't love being in front of the camera. I don't love being the center of attention. I hate speaking in public. And I've had to learn all those skills to sort of like prop myself up and do it anyway, but I'm much happier in a much more quiet, private scenario. And I'm much more internal, I think, than people would probably expect. And you were watching your mom, the wonderful Blythe Danner, as a, as a young girl, yes. having a, an exciting life and playing these incredible parts. Yeah. And so that's probably, right, you were just kind of following exactly. what she was doing. You know, 
My mother, when I was, I spent so much time sitting, watching her rehearse plays. It was like my, such a giant part of my childhood. And she was just so incredibly powerful. And she had such freedom on stage. And so I was like, well, I want to do that as a job because yeah. that looks, you know, but I, I didn't realize that there were other <laughs> means to that. I thought, you know, you have to be an actress in order to really be real, you know, self-realized like my mom. But, and I'm, and I wouldn't change anything, you know, and, and especially when I look back on certain times in my life or certain roles or um, certain plays I did or certain movies that, you know, had an impact on people. I'm so happy that I did all of that. You know, that was really special and a very unique life. So when you were coming up trying to be like your mom, it was kind of just for fun. Mm -hmm. What was the point at which you said, oh, this could be my life. This could be my career. My parents always said that I always said I wanted to be an actress from the time I could speak. And so I was very focused on it. And I knew, I knew when I was in high school that I was going to do it and I was going to be able to have some success. Like I could feel it, you know? And so I don't know if I could feel it because it was going to happen or I manifested it because I had that belief, but um, I never questioned it. I, I really, I had a very like strong bullseye, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that I was going, moving towards. You went on this incredible run of like, Seven Emma just... sliding doors into Shakespeare in Love, where you win the Oscar, mm -hmm. and clearly your life is turned upside down. Yeah, the cameras chasing you everywhere. Yeah. What was that transition like in your life? Very overwhelming. It's very intense. You know, there's like a I, I crossed a threshold at some point. I, I'm, I think it was probably around the time of winning the Oscar, where you know you go from people kind of being curious about you or discovering you or rooting for you to the whole, to it all being upended and people really wanting to tear you down and take great pleasure in it um, and wanting to know everything about you in a way that can feel really intrusive and it was really intense i mean really really intense Pretty i had scary days where, at times. yes absolutely i mean you know where you're thinking there's going to be car accidents mm -hmm. and people are tapping your phone and writing all kinds of stuff about you that is not true. And it's a lot. And it gets away from you. You can't control all that, right? You can't put no. your finger in every hole in the dam. You just have to. Which ends up being a really beautiful lesson because it's really just a microcosm. It's re and it's really just a lesson in knowing who you are, loving the people you love, being totally in integrity and like f everybody else. <laughs> now that I know you cannot say on morning television. We bleep that. You set the candle. You open the door to whatever. Okay, now. good. <laughs> so I, I mean, it seems like probably that was part of the reason too, where you were already thinking about spinning out of acting because you didn't love the extra stuff that came with it, which brought you to this place to goop in some yeah. ways. I think that's true. And of course, like as I said, you know, I still am the public like consumer facing person for the brand too. So I have to stay a little bit connected to the public, which is fine. But also I think that I'm older now and I'm not doing movies with so much regularity. It's like simmered down a bit, which mm -hmm. feels really nice. So when you think Gwyneth about the Hollywood side of your life now, mm -hmm. what does it take to get you involved? Because you've done some cool stuff, right? Politician and a bunch of other things. Little, yeah, little bits here and there. I mean, if my husband was doing something and wanted me to do it, I would do it. Mm -hmm. I think I would work with friends if they wanted me, you know, like people that I know and love and if it wasn't too big of a part kind of a thing. Yep. Um, Iron Man? I mean, if I don't, I don't, I don't see how that could happen unless it was like a prequel, but then we would be too old, right? <laughs> right, so, right. But sure, I mean. Were those fun to drop into and play that cool very character? Fun, very yeah. fun. Yeah. And you know, Robert Downey is just like such a spectacular person who has remained a very, very close friend of mine for yeah. all these years. So I would always do something with Robert if he needed me for something. And if that was Iron Man, then I'll, I'd be there. Right. You heard it here first. <laughs> These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now.
and good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You have a big birthday coming up? Yep. Do we have plans? Are you excited about it? Oh my gosh. Does it mean something to you? Is it just another birthday? I am so excited about it. First of all, I'm so surprised and delighted that I'm not freaked out about it. Because when I was turning 40, I was a mess. And so I thought, oh boy, 50 is going to be, it's going to feel, and I feel so good. Like, I'm so happy to be turning 50. I feel so grateful. I think I grieved a lot of the, the peace around, like, the physical part, you know, I think when you grow up in the culture very much and like pictures of you everywhere and you turn 40, people make such a big deal about it that you think like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm over the hill. Like, and, and so there's a kind of grief and letting go of that youth in a way, but that I think also when I was turning 40, and I always say this like to my friends and my team, like I, I felt like then I turned 40 and I got this amazing software upgrade, which really felt like, oh, this is actually kind of great. And like, I feel like I can be who I am a little bit more and I have permission. Totally. And now I feel like that times a hundred and I just feel like this is who I am. And I, I really like myself and I really know all of my flaws and I'm really working on them, but like, I'm okay being where I am and I'm okay being who I am. And so I'm excited to turn 50. I'm, I'm really excited about it, actually. Um, well, cool. I, th I think we're going to try out a product. Oh, great. Which has some relationship to morning television. I'm going to help you. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Did you know about all this stuff before you started Goop? No. Were you into this? I mean, you were into skincare, but you didn't know all the clinical I was always into skincare. That's right. I didn't know what ingredients at, you know, are active at what level and that kind of thing. And like, what is the alternative, like the non-toxic alternative for, you know, X, Y, and Z. So that's been really fascinating to really like dive into the science and understand. It's pretty cool what you've done. Thank you. You've kind you. of blown open a market, <laughs> haven't you? I mean, we're, I think we definitely helped kind of usher in the clean beauty movement and first in writing about it and before we made our own products. And then um, I really did see like a white space there. I didn't see any luxury clean skincare. And, um, and so now we're just trying to make products that, you know, that are people's favorites and that they keep coming back and back for. And so it's great. It's exciting. Well, congrats on Thanks. the big success of it. Thank you. the neighborhood. Yes, it is. You've been here a long time, haven't you? Well, I moved to actually to the Upper West Side in 1976. Wow. And when you first came to town. When I first came to town, but yeah. up, up this far, uh, probably in the 90s, something like that. Yeah. I mean, I've lived all over the West Side, actually. And this is one of your spots? Yes. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thanks for doing this, Kevin. Good to see you. Nice to see you, man. Nice to be around the neighborhood with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good spot. Um, I hope you won't take this the wrong way, but I just finished watching the movie and it's a little hard for me to be this close to you right now, <laughs> having seen what I just saw. <laughs> well, then I had the desired effect. You did your job, my friend. Um, tell, tell me about this movie when it came across your desk, they slash them, yeah. um, and what you saw in it that you thought would be cool or exciting or a fun character to play. Yeah, um, John Logan, who I've known for many, many years and is a very, very uh, excellent, successful writer of uh, films and television as well as the theater, um, said, I, I've got something for you. And John had created this uh, screenplay that was 
very much following the uh, format of an a 70s or 80s slasher movie. It takes place in a summer camp. Uh, there's, you know, axes and knives and a lot of blood. And I was in the original Friday the 13th. I know. So I know, you know, yeah, I know this I world to a certain so. extent. I also am a very big fan of horror. But he had followed that format and brought in this very, very interesting idea of it taking place in a gay conversion camp. And John, uh, looking at the fact that this was even a possibility in our country, that someone would think that you could try to change the way someone is, he looked at that as a, as a, as a horror. And it is a horror. And so I, the, uh, a lot of the characters are LGBTQIA plus characters, the, the campers, for lack of a better uh, word. And, you know, what John had written was a guy who um, is genuinely laying out these sort of logical points of view about how we are meant to essentially fit into some gender normative categories. And that if these campers are willing to, he can make their lives better. And we talked a lot about him saying this with as much sincerity <laughs> as he possibly could muster. And, and that became uh, kind of the basis of, of the character. Well, you give us this week, and we might be able to help. And if not, just enjoy the sunshine and work on your tan. How do you get into that place of something that's so contradictory? I assumed everything you believe and the way you think. Like, what's that? What's that headspace like for you to play someone like this? Well, you know, when I became an actor, uh, the, the, the whole idea for me was to try to walk in somebody else's shoes. You know, whether good or bad is, uh, is not to me so much the issue as it is, are they fascinating, complicated, and, and uh, uh, interesting men whose shoes I haven't walked in before? And when it comes to people who do terrible, terrible things to other people, the first word out of someone's mouth is, oh, that guy's a monster, but he's an absolute monster. To me, the frightening thing is not to uh, make him a monster, but to make him a human being. Mm. Um, regardless of, of anybody that I've played who does terrible things, I want people to feel like that's an actual human being. Mm. And to me, that ends up being scarier than yeah. The theme of the movie is summarized nicely at the end by one of the main characters about people just being who they are and not being able to be changed. Mm -hmm. What did you see at the center of this? Because we were talking a minute ago, this isn't just like an 80s slasher movie and everybody dies and that's it. I think it's, it's that you, we have to let people be who they are. And this idea that based on whatever it is that you're basing something on, your, your religion generally or your the politics or, or your life experience that you can take somebody uh, who is essentially one thing and uh, uh, convert them to be something completely different is ridiculous. It's, 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 it, it's inhumane. But uh, what I responded to was taking a genre and a, a kind of style of filmmaking that has the potential of drawing people in just because it's entertaining, you know, that it's, it, it is a very entertaining movie, it you is. know, it's like a, it's, it's got moments of like kind of rah rah, it's got heroic moments, it's got blood, it's got scares, you know what I mean, it's, it's like, it's a pop kind of movie. And then uh, you kind of add this piece of it that will uh, hopefully make people think and question what I'm doing in that camp. Mm -hmm. You do pick such interesting things, like here comes a, a horror movie that has this message at the center of it. Is it at this point for you, like the people you get to work with, the people you trust? I, th I think it really, it starts with, with, with the guy that I'm going to play. It, you know, if I, if I look at that guy and I say, is it different than the, than the last person that I played? Yes. Uh, do I have a little bit of a, a hook? Do I have an idea? Do I have an in in terms of um, this, this man? Or um, am I really going to have to dig deep to figure it out? If I have a hook, it makes it a little bit easier. And then after I look at the character, then I'll go, 
well, who, who else is involved? You know, is it a, a director who either I like and know, or is it someone whose work I've liked, or you know, then it just kind of goes from there. There are a lot of young actors in this movie, some really good ones too, yeah. right? So on a set like that, you know, you're just a small group of you, you're at a camp somewhere near Atlanta. <laughs> That's right. Are you sort of, do they come to you? I'm always curious about that. Someone who's so respected, are you sort of the, the wise man on set? Uh, yeah, you know, that's funny because now I, I, don't, I don't even think about myself in this way, but now I, I look around and I stop and I go, wait a second, I'm, not my, I'm the oldest person, not even in the cast, like I'm the oldest person of the director, the crew, like everybody. And, and uh, that is a weird position that it's in because I just don't wake up and think of myself in that kind of way. I also don't really think of myself as, if I enter into a company of players, I don't. I'm not. I'm not there to teach them how to act. You yeah. know, I'm there to be part of um, the ensemble, uh, to you know, do my work and you know, learn my stuff and come in and, and do my, my do my best. That being said, I think in this case, some of them had more experience than others, and yeah. no one had as much experience as myself. And so, John, you know, he said to me, "I I, I need you to." Um, I need you to lead the charge in terms of uh, what this set becomes. Um, it's very important to me that, and especially in something like this, that a set is a uh, positive working environment, a safe working environment. So if, to the extent that I can influence that, I do. In fact, uh, he very specifically made the first speech that I say to the campers, the first scene that we shot. And they basically have to just stand there during my monologue, take after take, and, uh, and, and watch me. And I think that he did that because he wanted to show that, you know, I knew my lines, basically. <laughs> yeah, right. This is how a pro does it, right? Right. Yeah, well, I might also add that, you know, when you have... Um, 20 uh, or younger people, there's a lot I can learn from them too. Sure. About their experience, about uh, you know, their lives. Um, the, you know, all of the casting was done with um, a, a very close eye to the fact that these actors have a related experience in, in their lives to the characters that they play. So, you know, I got a lot to learn from them too. And, you know, I think that he, the hope for all of us is that for uh, a young person who is in some way uh, feels other, feels disenfranchised, feels like an outsider, can look at the movie and say, okay, I can root for these guys, mm -hmm. and that's me. Um, that's my hope. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are. NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Who mean Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Growing up in Philly, I was reading a bunch of interviews where you were basically saying, like, you love the idea of performing, mm -hmm. you love being on stage, and the idea purely at that point anyway was, I want to be famous. 
was that because your dad was sort of this legendary architect and city planner and his name was in the paper and was that part of it that drove you to acting do you think i think so yeah my mother um was the one that sort of uh encouraged the artistic creative side of all of us all six of us you know her one of the first uh presents that i ever got from from, from her was a box full of costumes mm. so right away you know i was performing you know taking on a, you know other characters but my father he was very very well known in philadelphia and there there's a lot of stuff that was written about him and he, and uh i think that you know he looked at success in some ways as uh having success on a on a you know on a very public a very public mm. way um and so yeah i wanted that So it was a, almost a competitive thing oh, with yeah. that. No, I definitely think so. I mean, you know, I, I don't I don't think that's an unusual yeah. uh thing for a, you know, man with his father, you know. I I I wanted to I definitely want to be more famous than him. Was that the um drive that sent you to New York City when you were 17 years old? What was the plan? I mean, I know you <laughs> went to Circle in the Square, you get off the bus at Yeah, Port uh, Authority and say I'm here. Yep. suitcase in a dream 100% um slept on my sister's couch i had auditioned to get into the summer uh workshop at circle in the square but decided to stay at that point in my life i had become to began to really focus on the craft as much as the career as much as the uh you know the the fame and and recognition it 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 in a weird kind of way it it stayed in the back of my mind but it had um become less important than trying to be good to mm. try to be you know whatever a serious actor for whatever that means well that's what's so interesting about it you quickly get animal house then friday the 13th then diner and then of course footloose you okay. wanted to be a stage actor what was it like for you to sort of as i say be swept along and not overnight but pretty quickly become a big star yeah uh it was um well i can tell you that it didn't feel quick Footloose came out I was about 24 well, you know when I got here I was 17 so that seemed like a pretty long yeah. to me it seemed like a long road and all those steps while they were ended up being iconic things like Animal House and Friday the 13th and Diner none of them felt like my life had changed it wasn't right. until Footloose that I really felt like think my life had changed um yeah it was terrifying i i i think i was conflicted about it you know i i think that the thing It was never the work like the work was I was always good with it was all the other stuff that was um I was resistant to you know that felt weird to me you know press um uh photo sessions uh signing autographs premieres it it, it, it I, of course I loved it on one level because it was an acknowledgement that whatever I was doing was getting seen but i had a real kind of like uh sort of very conflicted feelings about it. uh you know never moved to la for instance you know um you know I, i've adjusted that that, that way <laughs> right. of thinking right. through the years and i really understand the, our business and i understand the importance of of you know like what we're doing and and uh, all the rest of it but uh uh at when i was young i had a hard time with it. Are you shocked by the endurance of Footloose? It's still right here uh-huh. in front of us almost what 40 years later. I think that um it was a great uh, gift, you know, uh, to be part of that movie and um I certainly took it very seriously when I was when I was doing it and uh I love that people will still come up and say that they just showed it to their kids. Actually one thing that really uh sort of re ignited the whole response to it I think was the fact that they did the Broadway show and then after the Broadway show uh it leaves its run it then becomes available to be done in every single high school in right. America and there's right. not that many plays certainly music musicals where you can uh, have a musical with a bunch of high school kids in it right and so i mean everybody does feel loose it is amazing i mean people it's it holds up not everything holds up but it definitely does do you feel kevin like that pushing hollywood away that you just described did that ever hurt you i think that i'm very happy with my career i i 
wouldn't change a, a single piece of it because I, you know, that's like that high, hindsight's twenty twenty thing. I do think that um, after Footloose, there was quite a few years before um, JFK and Apollo Thirteen, River Wild, you know, the, yeah. where where uh, I made some kind of bad choices um, that were not. I was neither embracing the movie star thing, nor was I really finding uh, what I'm good at, which is being a character actor. Mm -hmm. And I think there was an element of self-sabotage that was going on at that point. Uh, you know, I just personally wasn't very happy, and, mm. and, and, and it just was, you know, it was... A, it was but, you know, in, in the greater scheme of a career, I look at that as like a blip on the radar. It's probably right. like, you know, five years or right. whatever, or something. But, but. Uh, but it also taught me, and I and I figured out uh, another way in. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Part of this is probably meeting and marrying Kira somewhere in there, but how have you kept, given your level of fame, some normalcy in your life? You're both famous, mm -hmm. but you seem to just kind of live your life around New York City. I don't know. I just, uh, it's just a choice. I mean, I th is, it, is it a weird life? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's definitely things that are weird about it, but um, uh, I, th I feel like, you know, it's very easy if you achieve a, uh, a certain level of stardom to, to live in a world that really, uh, uh, you, you're not really in touch with reality. Yeah. And if you only put yourself, you know, in a giant, uh, you know, SUV or, or behind a, a, a big, you know, uh, electrified wall, you know, I don't feel like I'm gonna get a chance to uh, be in touch with the people that I'm going to be asked to play, you right? Know? You know, it's like I, I've played mo I've played movie stars. I've played myself as kind of like a joke, and I kind of like that. But that's not normally the role that's, that I'm going to get. You know, right. I'm going to get a I don't know, whatever, regular person. You mm -hmm. know, so so I feel like in order to still be able to do that, I need to just not live not try to breathe too much rarefied air. Don't you think part of that is living in New York too? Because Definitely. if you're in LA, you wake up behind your gate, you get in your darkened car, you go to where you're going. Here, oh. you're contacting people all day. Listen, New York to me, people would have a hard time believing this. To me, New York is the most celebrity friendly place you can be, except for Midtown. <laughs> I mean, if you, st but because wherever, wherever there are, are and, and believe me, I love New York tourism, don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. 
bring on the tourists. But when you're in a tourist situation, that's a lot different than being sure. in a neighborhood. It's just different. New Yorkers, people think <clears throat> this, this reputation that New Yorkers are, you know, somehow, I don't know, rude or something like that. To me, it's that they're busy. Yeah. You know, they got to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and so that the time that <laughs> is wasted uh, by, you know, stopping and, you know, asking for a picture and da da da. It's yeah. it's more like, hey Kev, yeah. how you doing? Yes. Your last movie, not too <laughs> not too good. But, you know, keep up the good work, all right? You know, it's like that's that's mostly what you know, that's mostly what you get. So you mentioned six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Mm. There's like this cult of personality around you that's out of your control completely. <laughs> it's out of my control, yeah. They're like restaurants with your name on it that yeah, aren't yeah, even yeah. yours all right. over the world. Right. What do you make of that fascination with you and your career? I don't know. Because man. you didn't love Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon when it started. Well, no, I didn't love it because I, maybe because I had an instinct that that's what it was, more of a cult of personality than an actual acknowledgement of any, any of the work right, that I've done. Right. I'm totally fine with it now, you know. Uh, but it was also, I felt like it was a joke at my expense, basically, that, that they were saying, can you believe that this lightweight could be, you know, connected to someone like, you know, Meryl Streep or uh, Laura. Actually, I did a movie with Meryl Streep, yeah. so I was definitely connected. But, but I mean, Lawrence Olivier or any of the great, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis, whatever the great, the great actors, because yeah. he's just, you know, he's just Kevin Bacon. Right? Oh, see, I never took it that way. Uh, that's so interesting. Right. Well, that's just, you know, that's the actor's of course. insecurity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? The, 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 I always thought it was look at the breadth of his career. Uh -huh. Look at all the work he's done. Look at all the people he's been in movies with. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, you know, but. You know, I think that it's it's out of my control, as you said. Yeah. You know, I can't I can't not have it, and uh, all I can do is just you know try to do my best when I when I when they say action. What does Kira think about that kind of stuff? Should she laugh at you? Uh, she doesn't. I, I, you know, listen. This is what happens. Every every night around five o'clock, we play a couple rounds of the game. I, I make her play it. Yeah. <laughs> Guests. You know, if anyone comes over like to the house for the weekend, we're going to play at least three or four hours of the game. So they just know that that's the deal. Listen, you know. Boy, you really have embraced it. <laughs> You're forcing. Can you imagine? Oh, oh my, my God. Honey, we're going to play that game again. It's time. Six degrees of me. <laughs> for breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. NBC News, streaming free now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. I've got to ask you about City on a Hill. Uh -huh. Boy, what a great show. Thank you. Season three coming up here yep. in just a couple of weeks. How yep. much fun is that character to play? Oh, he's awesome. He's, he's awesome. That's one of those guys where, again, as I was saying, you know, I, I read him and right away, like, I saw him, I saw the way he looked, I saw the way he dressed, I saw, like, the, 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 the movement, I heard his voice. And it's almost hard to describe, but it's, it's like you know the guy so well or you know how he feels inside your body so well that you could throw him into any situation. Yeah. And I, you know, you I could just 
be him. It's not like I have to, you know, prep myself into right. the thing. I put, I sit down in the chair. Um, you know, they do they do the thing, the hair, and and uh, I put on those suits and those shoes, and like I can just I can just feel him. Right. And I love the character. He's so great. Mustache too is yeah. on point. Yeah. For somebody who grew up in Hollywood, where TV was not something you did, and you're mm-hmm. again not alone in that. You've clearly embraced it now, and I oh, yeah. imagine part of that is you, the story doesn't end after you're done sure. with the movie, right? Yeah. Maybe there's season four and a five, and you get to keep changing and developing and growing the character. Totally, yeah. It's it's really tough to explore multiple aspects of uh, one person's existence in a two-hour movie. You know, if I take a character like Jackie, it's like... Well, here he is, but now let's see what would happen to him uh, if, you know, he gets sick. Let's see what would happen to him if, if um, it, you know, his daughter was having problems. You can only maybe pick one or two of those in, in the course of a film. So it's, it's really great. And I, I learned it a lot from Kira because when she got on The Closer, I had never done television you know I had a very very strict rule about not doing it because that was the that's how I was sort of brought up you know as an actor was that I was a theater and movie actor but definitely not a television actor and I saw Kira's experience of you know continuing to over seven years find new things and new, new stuff to say about this this woman and she loved it you know and it was that, along with the fact that, you know, you're looking at The Wire, and Six Feet Under, and The Sopranos, and you're going, I want to do that. That's like, that's yeah. good stuff, you know. So if I asked you which project someone out on the street in New York yells at you the most about in your incredible career, which mm-hmm. one is it? Yeah, I think probably Footloose, although <laughs> when I go out to the heartland, it's Tremors. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so it depends a little bit on the demo. That was a hit. Yeah. 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 Well, Tremors was interesting because it was not a hit at the box office, but when it was released on, on, on video, it became a, a real monster video title and, and continued to be, and then they made a bunch of sequels. Uh, so for um, a lot of people, you know, that aren't coastal elites, it was a very, uh, very, very popular movie. I also love that you say every once in a while somebody puts a picture in front of you of you dying in Friday the 13th. Yeah. So sign that for me. Well, well first off, the, the whole idea of, of autographs is, was pretty much gone, yeah. except for people who actually collect them, and I don't know what they're going to do. And I think that what they do is they will wait for you to die. I think they're hoping that you're going to die. I think the close, the older I get, the more people want autographs. That's what I've noticed. But, uh, they, they, but yeah, this one picture is me like this. And my, my neck, my throat is cut, there's blood just, you know, yeah. pouring out of my mouth and everything. And it's, I'm dead. So it's like, it's just a weird thing to sign. <laughs> Best wishes, you know. Yeah. It's weird being famous, huh? <laughs> You know, but it's mostly good. Yeah. It really is. This has been so much fun. Thanks so much, Kevin. Congrats on the movie. It's Thank great. you so much. It's great. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thanks. <laughs> it's good to see you, Emma. Thank good you for doing you. this. The film is extraordinary. Uh, I just finished watching it this morning. It's funny, it's heartbreaking. I said to you, I think it's a brave performance by you. What did you think, Emma, when you first got this script? Well, I got, I know Katie, the writer, so, and she said, you know, I've thought of you. And as soon as it started, the situation was what got me. You know, you've got a 63-year-old ex-religious education teacher and she's in a room and you think, OK, what's happening? She's a bit nervous. There's a knock on the door and a 28-year-old sex worker walks in and she's hired him. That's like my favourite situation of all time. <laughs> I mean, I love all the work that I've done before, but I've never been put in that situation. I've never seen these people. I've never seen this situation. And the fact that she's so terrified. I mean, it was. can you imagine what bliss it was to play? 
You know, she's full of assumptions about this right. young man. And then slowly it all gets kind of stripped away. Everything gets stripped away, including what she's wearing. You know, <laughs> finally, she's, they unpeel one another, but in the most kind of... It's an, it's an examination of right intimacy that we're not used to because we associate intimacy with romance, which, of course, can be a little bit delusional. So you were in at the jump, is it I fair was to say? in at the jump. As soon really? as that knock came on the door, I said, I want to do it. Don't, <laughs> don't give it to anybody else. Everyone was, I, I'll do it. Yes, absolutely. It, it, intimate is an understatement for this film. Did you have any reservations about the physical side of it? Or did you embrace that and think this is an important role for me to play? Well, you know, in the script, it doesn't really say much. It just... In fact, I think Sophie and Katie took a while to work out whether they sh whether there should be a sex scene. And it was Sophie who said, there has to be a sex scene. We have to have a sex scene. So, um, for uppermost in my mind, interestingly, mm. nor indeed was nudity uppermost in my mind. I didn't really think about that. The real challenge was, how do we make this funny, compassionate, moving, really pleasurable to watch when we, we don't have, like, New Zealand to give it scale, you know? Um, but it, the scale is in the seismic emotions of what these people go through and also the, the hilarity of, of someone wanting something but not able to... It's, it's both heartbreaking and funny and that's my favourite combination. How would you describe to someone who's thinking about going to see this Nancy, which we learn later, maybe mm. perhaps isn't her real name, mm. where is she in her life and why does she even entertain the idea of, of bringing this young man to a hotel room? She's a 63-year-old religious education teacher, retired. Um, she's been widowed for two years. Something has happened in her mind, in her body. She's just gone, I, I've never experienced sexual pleasure, not really, not ever. Except I do remember that one time when I was 16 and that mm. Greek boy did that thing. What can I do? I don't fancy any of these men. They're all old, like me. I want a young person because the last time I experienced this, I was young. And that's, I think, why she hires someone so much younger than her. But also because it makes him far away. She can feel like in the stronger position because she's old. I mean, everything she goes through mm. is so... It's so much like seeing someone, you have a fantasy and you try and make it real and the reality is just not what you were expecting, the opposite of what you were expecting and she's unable to go through. It's only Leo who makes her say, do you understand what you've done here? You want something and it's here and you can have it. And she says, but I can't, I can't cope with what it is that I want. Yeah. And I think that women, are not encouraged to think about what they want anyway. I mean, I can think of the number of times I've said, or oh, someone said, what do you want? And I mean, obviously it's normally a martini, but um, <laughs> and that kind of covers all bases because then you can at least relax enough to think about what actually do I want? And um, Nancy's just, she's, I love her. She's very dignified. She's a very normal, ordinary woman. She's occasionally a bit bigoted and a bit stupid about things. And she's internalized all kinds of, misogynistic attitudes, which she parrots out, you know, and then is suddenly challenged by this incredibly intelligent young man who's sort of compassionate and humane and ironic and sees her. They see each other. And it's, it's intimacy without romance, which is just, when do you see that? How did you build that chemistry before the cameras even started rolling. You know, you can't, you, you sort of build it as you play. We were really lucky because we had six days rehearsal, which is very unusual for a tiny movie. We shot it in 19 days. Mm. But one on one of the days, the three of us, our, our director, Daryl and I, said, right, we need to just all take our clothes off and get used to the fact that at some point or other, the two of us are going to be naked on set and they'll be very set about this size, but with less people in it, actually. Mm. You know, very close set. But still, you know, it's, it's a big thing. But by the time we got to it, we were so relieved for both characters that they were finally getting a moment of freedom and release and relaxation. And so it was rather a joy. And I know that sounds very odd, because it's very odd to us to think, as people who aren't in the business, what is it like to take your clothes off in front of, you know, anyone in the in, in a room, uh, people that you don't actively know? But of course, it's really very normal and ordinary. We're just not used to it, that's all. 
And so what was that scene like, the three of you? Well, we, I mean, we just sat and talked about our bodies piece by piece, really. We talked about the bits that we liked and the bits that we didn't like and why they were the shape that they were. I mean, Daryl was in very good shape because he'd been to the gym because Leo goes to the gym. You know, Nancy was, as you see her, because she's a teacher. She's not a gym bunny. I mean, if Nancy had a six-pack, you'd just go, I don't believe uh, that she does that or has that. So it was all about... I'll tell you what it's about. It's about having trust in your audience as well. Mm. And that is what we're here for, actors. You know, challenge ourselves and trust your audience. I think anyone watching it will feel is sort of the unseen life or the unfelt life where Nancy says, my kids didn't even notice when I was disappointed. Do you feel like that's something that even you could relate to or that people watching this film will say, yeah, I see some of that. I've denied myself pleasure along the way in the interest of helping others or my family or, mm. or something else. Do you see that? Yes, I do. I really do. I think there's a real distinction, though, between individualism and a materialism that we live in, which I don't think gives us much pleasure, actually. But to create a relationship with yourself that's sort of self-sustaining means you don't need stuff from outside. It means that you can go inside yourself and have a relationship that's, you know, s sort of nourishing. I think that's very hard to achieve, especially if you're there to serve other people, which women so often are. And the, the question of female pleasure is an even larger one, isn't it? In a way, all of us, men and women, have been taught not to respect sexual pleasure, mm. to think of it as somehow animalistic and not part of our higher selves, you know? And I think that Nancy understands that, and she goes, but, but surely it can't just be that. Surely it's not just this this hidden forbidden thing that I, because I remember that moment. She remembers that moment when she's touched by this boy when she's 16 and she, none of that has prevented her. She's not brainwashed yet by the rules. And she suddenly feels this extraordinary thing. And that's when, you know, your boundaries melt with really beautiful, proper sexual pleasure. Your bound, you suddenly, you know, a one with the universe. I'm sorry to go all like spooky on it, no. but I do think that that's the case. So it's a big conversation, but it's one that it, this film's so wonderful to start that conversation with because it's a joyful, happy, beautiful pleasure of a film. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We were talking about the body image before mm. we started, ranging from a woman like Nancy to a teenage girl on Instagram these days. Mm. The images that are out there that you have to hold yourself up to, I know. it can be impossible. It can feel I could never live up to that. Yeah. How do we get past that? It's a big job, I know. It is a big job. But, I mean, again, this is part of it. You have to tell these kinds of stories and put these kinds of bodies on the screen. Otherwise, how can you fight the iconography? You know, it's not about being old. It's about, it's about not being able to look at your body and go, that's my body. You don't need to say, what a wonderful body. 
You know, you don't need to, but, but what you really need not to do is waste your time, your energy, your passion, your purpose in life, thinking you, you've got to make it different. It's just awful what we've done to ourselves. And it's particularly for women, it's such a waste of our time. You know, I have to look at it and think I, I'm so gorgeous. That's too much to ask, I think, given what we've been brainwashed with. And I think it's hard for men as well. But it's different because, because appearance has not been written in to the status of men in the same way as it mm. has been into the status of women. So that's where, you know, we're, we're on completely different playing yes. fields. Um, and m my answer to it, as, as with what I have to give, is this movie, which I couldn't have made five to ten years ago. Now, why do you say that? You couldn't have made it five, ten years because ago. Because I think I wouldn't have been ready myself, but I also think that the Me Too movements and the mainstream discussion about consent and abuse and all of that, coming into a much more mainstream, that has changed the landscape. And I think that the film lands in a completely different way because mm. of that discussion. Because we have actually, we've been involved in that discussion about, about what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable um, for some years now. And whilst there's a long way to go, um, that's, that's changed things. I read a quote from you in an interview where you said, I stopped trying to starve myself a long time ago mm. in Hollywood, and yet, Look at the career you've had. Mm. Have you felt that pressure over the course of your career to look like something or to oh, achieve some ideal? Absolutely. No, I've actually had this thought in my mind, which is they want me to go to LA. I can't I can't go to LA. I'm actually too fat. Oh come on. I'm too fat to go to LA. No, I've had that thought many times in the past when I was younger. Because you think of Hollywood and you think of those ideals and go, I don't fit. I will never fit. That has been my experience. Mm. And you have to ask other actors about theirs because I can't compare it to anybody's. But you know, when I meet other actors, they're so tiny. So I, I just look at them and go, how do you, how do, I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you sustain that. And, 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 and have, a, have a lot, I don't understand it. So this is a, you know, it's a discussion that we don't really have very often. Um, but I hope we will open that Pandora's box. So how did you get past that? Were you, was it success? Was it winning an Oscar? Was it, oh, I can do this and be me? But don't forget, I'm a character actor. I was never the sort of glamorous, sexy lead type woman. You know, I mean, I hit Hollywood with Howard's End. You know, a blue stocking with slightly too many teeth. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like... You know, I, I was ever a glamour ro figure or a, um, a, a, a kind of sexualized figure, quite the opposite, I think, actually, which was probably the attraction in the sense that I was sort of different. And um, if I've read a script which described the, the person I was being asked to look at um, as, as beautiful, I would stop reading it. Really? Yeah. Absolutely. Because you assumed it wasn't for you. I just thought, it's not, I can't do that. I just can't do it. It's not right for me. Mm. And this is early in your career? I mean, so all the way through, I would still wouldn't do it. That's why I've actually, <laughs> um, I think, had quite an interesting time of it. Because I think, you know, I've cho the, the stuff I've chosen has not been just because of that. But, you know, I've necessarily, because of my mindset, my politics, my feminism, the way in which I think about the world, the way in which I look at characters and choose them, you know, I'm not interested in presentation of that kind. But that's a relief more than anything, right. you know, because then I get to play things that I think are more interesting. I mean, look, you know, in my 40s, I just remember being offered the, don't do that, darling, it's too brave. Oh my God, is it, is it Jeff? Oh God, he did the thing. He did the brave, heroic thing that I told him he shouldn't do. <laughs> he should be home with us, with the family. That, though, that so many of those roles in, the, in my 40s, I just said, no, thank you. No, thank you. That was a wonderful performance, I know, by the it's, way. I would have done them so well. I would have done them very well. <laughs> Don't go do the brave thing, honey. We need you here. <laughs> These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now.
NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. NBC News, streaming free now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Can I ask you about your your origins in acting? Obviously, you're the, the daughter of two actors, and you came up through Cambridge Footlights and did all those prestigious uh, things that one does along the way. At what point did you decide for yourself that this was not just a hobby, but a career? By the time I'd gone to the, okay, the Avignon Theatre Festival and seen a production of Racine's Phaedra 16 times, <laughs> where, by the way, all the actors took their clothes off, is that right? Mm -hmm. Full circle. Full circle. Full circle. And I wrote to my dad and I said, I, I really want to, to do this. I wanted to do character comedy, which I did for a long time. I didn't do straight acting till I was 10 years later, till I was about 26. So how, how old were you when you told your father? That 16. You... Oh, wow. Very young. Hmm. So that was it from that point? No, it wasn't because I went into Footlights and I was doing comedy. So I wanted to be a comedian and was a comedian, including a stand-up comedian, until I was 26. So, you know, the acting is different to that. So what's, what's the jump then from comedy to dramatic actor? How did that happen? Um, I was working with Robbie Coltrane, the Scottish actor, who w was about to do a, a series a great series called Tutti Frutti, written by John Byrne, a, Scot a Scottish series. And um, he said, they said, we need a girl who can do a Scottish accent. And he said, oh, I'm half Scottish. <laughs> Ask her. So I, that was it. And that's where it started. Is that right? Yeah. And on the first day on set, I thought, I'm a bit nervous, actually. And then I thought, I suppose it's like playing a sketch, only just for longer. So that's how I approached it. Um, I don't think it is like playing a sketch, but for longer, but now, but at the time it was a help. It Got was you a through that thought. moment. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. And you go, this is a bit later, of course, but you go on this incredible run that starts, as you imagine, with, as you mentioned, with Howard's End, uh, where you win an Academy Award yeah. right out of the gate. Was mm. that shocking to you to have suddenly been thrust to the yes. top of Hollywood's list, effectively? Yes, it, it was shocking. It's, it's a very good word. Yeah, it was, to I got a chest infection. I mean, I was just appalled. You know, it was too much actually. It's just a big glare. It was really scary. I got that you're supposed to go and do all this, but I just got ill and ended up in, in a Is sanatorium right? for a couple of like a week, just trying to recover before I could get over there and and do the thing. Because but, of the attention and all the things that came with it. Mm, mm. Something mm. you weren't accustomed to. No, no, I don't think it's entirely healthy. And then you go on that incredible run through 92 and 93 and into 95 with Sense and Sensibility where you win the Oscar for the adapted screenplay for writing it, mm. which is quite a task to take on, quite a challenge to take on as your first writing project. Yeah. Let's do Jane Austen and put it in, <laughs> into film. <laughs> what possibly compelled you to take on 
uh, something that large and that beloved? Well, obviously, I didn't have the idea. Our wonderful producer, Lindsay Duran, had seen my sketch comedy show. That's what brought her to me. And, I, and she said, do you feel like trying to adapt Sense and Sensibility? And I said, OK, I'll give it a go. The first script was 350 pages long, <laughs> you know. And then we just worked and worked and worked for five years, you know, redoing it, redoing it, Lindsay's notes, and I would redo the draft and redo the draft and redo the draft. And we finally ended up with with um, with the script that you you know. And it's actually very interesting because there are, it, particularly in classics, there are scenes you think, I can't do without. That's going to be the best scene. That's just going to be the best one. And um, you make it, and it's so not the best one, and it ends up being cut from the movie. Mm. That's what's interesting about adaptation and the distillation of any kind of great work. Is you, it's very unexpected what works on camera. And you have to get it right, because there are people who love Jane Austen, love the book so much. They're oh. waiting with bated breath. What are they going to do with this? Absolutely. It's a little bit of pressure, I imagine. No, and I mean, the Jane Austen Society is like the militant wing. It's heavily <laughs> armed, you know. And I mean, I met a woman on the plane who found out that I'd cut one of the characters, Lucy's uh, sister, Anne. And she literally stopped talking to me mid-sentence and walked away. <laughs> I mean, obviously, to go and get something to hurt me with, because she was so appalled. I mean, this is, yeah, it's interesting. People have strong feelings. They have very strong feelings, surprisingly strong feelings. But generally, people were happy. It turned out well. It yes. turned out OK. Yes. Except, except for the, the, wing, the publicity wing, or I can't remember who rang me from, um, from the studio and said, um, we just wondered if you'd be interested in writing. Um, the novel uh, from the film, and I said, um, <laughs> "But no, it's, it's adapted from." It, yes, we know that. I mean, as a human being, this <laughs> wonderful woman said, "I agree with you. I love that." As a human being, I agree with you. But as a studio executive, what I want you to do is write another version of *Sense and Sensibility* <laughs> oh, from the version that you've taken from the original novel. It, I could. I, I've. I've been laughing about that for 40 years. It's just. It's fantastic. Oh my god. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Ali Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. The movie you've said people ask you about most is Love Actually. Why do you think that movie has resonated and endured in the way that it has? Because of what it's about. Because Richard Curtis, who's such a large-hearted man, wanted to say, you know, it's all there is. And we know that deep down. We know that that's all there is. And that's the message of the film, full bottom line. All that matters is love. That's it. And there's a little bit, tell me if I'm making a leap, there's a little bit of Nancy in your character in that she's pushing a lot down. She's suppressing a lot. She's enduring a lot. Yeah. Those famous yeah. scenes where you are crying and then flip yeah. the switch. and OK, kids, mm. it's Christmas. Or OK, kids, your recital was perfect. All those moments. 
that I think a lot of people saw some of themselves. Well, yeah, that. because in order to be a sort of skillful and indeed um, efficient human being, which we do have to be for our children and our parents and all of the folk that we look after, it's practical and it's kind and it's an act of love to repress your emotions sometimes. Mm. It's terribly, terribly important to be able to do that, to navigate them, to learn the skill with which to navigate your feelings. I mean, that's the journey from childhood to adulthood, isn't it? Mm. So it's just, there's a difference though between learning to navigate with skill your emotional life and knowing when what you're doing is avoiding something that you need to address. Mm. Do you stop and watch Love Actually if it's on, like the rest of us? Are you a viewer of your own work? I'm not in love, actually, very much. And if it is on, I always sort of look at it and go, oh, no, oh, God, we all look so young. <laughs> God, look at you, good hair. That's, oh, you know, that's, um, what was her name? And then I go and make the dinner. That's, that's what it. happens. That's it. Yeah. Um, I promise I'm not going down your IMDb page, but last one I have to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what year yes, are we hang on? on. No, no. Yeah. Uh, the Harry Potter series hmm. um, introduced you to an entirely new audience. Was that fun to be a part of that and to play that character? It was such fun. I'm just glad that all those kids got so much pleasure and joy out of the movies and the books. You mentioned your activism, um, all the things you work on. Mm. Um, I've talked to some actors who say the only good thing about being this famous is that I can use it to promote other causes. Mm. Do you feel that way, that obviously your work is your work and you lead mm. with that, but that it is another ve a path, a vehicle for you to bring attention to other causes like human rights around the world and mm. climate change and mm. all the other things that you work on? Yeah, I do. I do think it's good. I think it's probably necessary. I mean, I've always been involved in activism since I was 19, so since long before yeah. I had that kind of amplified voice. Um, I think it's a, you know, it's a slightly double-edged sword and you have to be very careful about how you use it because um, fame's quite a toxic um, state, I would say. It's interesting, the larger your presence in terms of fame is, the less human you yes. will be seen and perceived and felt to be, which is feels like an, uh, a, a sort of contradiction in terms, but actually isn't, you know. Um, so whatever happens to you, no one will care. And that is very important to understand that there should be a handbook because people think that somehow fame involves being loved, which is not the case. It involves being well known. And yes, there may be affection, there may be um, a genuine sort of feeling because especially if you're making films that um, engage in people's deeper emotions. So you do have to navigate very carefully and know what you're talking about and know why you're doing it and how, in what way you can be useful. So for instance, if I'm doing human rights stuff, I think that the fourth sector or the charity sector, the NGO sector, non-governmental organizations, the fact that I have to explain the acronym speaks for itself because their language is often very abstruse and arcane. And so my job was to go and make a kind of human connective tissue by visiting places, talking to people, writing about it so that there was a connection being made between the people who wanted to learn about something that needed to be addressed over here, but needed to hear about it in a kind of human way. Mm. So in a sense, it's the same job. It's telling stories. Right, and people will stop and listen. And, and, and they pay might attention. stop and listen because you're drawing the, you know, the spotlight a bit. And, and sometimes it's, it can be very helpful. Well, you're using your fame beautifully, and thank you for making this film. I think people are going to love it. It's great to talk to you. And you, and you, really. Thanks, Thanks very so much. much for having me. Thank I really you. enjoyed that. So, Regina, you've spent a good amount of time in New York City. College, right. grad school. Yeah. And then I lived here in yeah. Harlem after that. Right. Well, in Manhattan, well, Upper West Side. Everything's been changed. Mm -hmm. But I love New York. Those are the early days of your career, which is where some of that auditioning and all those things were yeah. happening. It's so funny being here and going, like, catching the subway and going to all my auditions. This is when the subway was, like, a lot. Oh, yeah. But yeah. it was, like, $1.25, yeah. oh, mind yeah. you. But yeah, it's nostalgic, It's, but it's sweet. I also used to 
practice my um, acting with my acting partners in school, like mm. outside on the streets. Did you? Yeah. yeah. So this is kind of where it started this for you. This is where it started. This is, this, is, this is the beginning. This is where you powered through those no's. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hundreds. To get hundreds, where you are. Hundreds of no's. Right oh. Regina, thanks for doing this. Oh, no, I'm excited to do it. It's good to meet you where the Illuminati meets, apparently, <laughs> apparently in this amazing chapel. I know. There's a lot of interesting art. Speaking of church, congratulations on the movie. Uh, I just watched it this morning. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. It's funny. Mm -hmm. It's tragic. It makes you think. It's a movie within a movie. There's so many levels and layers to it. How do you describe it yeah. to people? Yeah, it has a very like dramedy-esque feel. Bit of a mockumentary because mm -hmm. it's a documentary within a movie. Yeah. Right. It's a lot of fun. I mean, there 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 are moments of gravity and levity. Yeah. Well, it's super funny, and I think what you said about the movie within the movie, the documentary is. It almost lets your character, Trinity, show both sides of herself, yeah. right? So when she's in the documentary, she's funny and she's keeping a good face on yes, and all she's that. She's trying. And then when you say cut or you say cut the yeah. cameras, okay, now here's the real story. Right. In the making of the documentary, yes. the problem was is that they couldn't control it in the way that they needed to. They couldn't control the narrative. Therein lies the problem, right? Right. Uh, so. We can edit around that. Right. So we should, without giving too much away, for people who are watching, and just explain the story a little bit yes, about yes. what happened. They got a big, successful mega church, <laughs> yes. and then they have a huge, successful mega church. And the 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 movie is about the the couple, who I mean, they've reached every height you can reach for a church, but um, they've there's a scandal that has occurred around Pastor Lee Curtis, and they are opening up their church, reopening their church, Easter Sunday. Pastor Lee Curtis, Sterling K. Brown, has decided he wants to document the opening. And they're humbled, to say the least, <laughs> standing out on the street asking people to honk for Jesus, right? Shake it for the Lord! Shake it for the Lord! You know, so many people honked. Yeah? They didn't realize it was us. It was down south, and they just instinctively honked. Oh, so those are real honks? Those, those are cars real, going by. Those are real honks. Oh, wow. So you had some experience with maybe not exactly this kind of church. You had family down south mm -hmm. when you were growing up, so mm -hmm. you sat in some pews. I don't know if they were at these mega churches, but where did you go to sort of learn about and to tap into who Trinity is? Well, I definitely have, you know, have visited several mega churches and attended them for stints. Um, they're also really accessible online because there's yeah. so many right now. But for Trinity, I really studied the first ladies, to be honest. There's a lot of shows where there are first ladies talking, interviews, talking about what it's like, kind of their role, which most people don't really think about. We need you back in that pulpit so you can get me back on that stage. Yeah. You know, you, people kind of judge it, especially when there's scandal. People say, well, why did she do this and why did she stay? But they really do, I found that all of them have a, a, a quiet strength mm. and that they are incredibly vital to the pastor and the ministry in a way that the public doesn't see because the pastor is, he is the face of the congregation and um, the personality of the congregation. And she is, she is probably the backbone. So you studied some game film, who would put it that way. You watched, you watched. I watched a lot. I talked to a few also uh -huh. and just asked them about how they felt. They end up, for lack of a better word, having to take a back seat to the congregation mm. because their husband has to meet the needs of the congregation. So if someone needs counseling, if some, you know, pastoral counseling, or if someone, you know, their family needs something, the wife seems to hold the space that allows him to do things kind of for everyone else first. Right. Sometimes that goes astray. Well. As we see in, the, <laughs> as we see in this movie sometimes, <laughs> not all the time. In this, yes, in this case, it definitely went astray. In this case, it yes, does. Yeah. Um, and your partner here is Sterling K. Brown. Yes, he plays my husband. A wonderful actor, Amazing. obviously, who people love. Did you know him well beforehand? Because you watch the chemistry in the movie, and there's so many scenes when it's just the two of you. You gotta have that. We got lucky. I had never, I did not know Sterling at all. Oh, really? I had seen him high and by. And then they were like, what do you think of Sterling K. Brown? And I said, it's, it, you know, I didn't know how funny Sterling was. Right. 
And I was like, huh? And then we met on a Zoom. And when I tell you it was instantaneous, like just adored him. So by the time we were on set, it was so organic and like, I don't know, it was like, I mean, Trinity and, and, and Lee Curtis, so they're meant for each other, yeah. for sure. God I put mean, them together. well, <laughs> <laughs> they're really almost meant for each other. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, with a little, little twist yeah. in there. He's obviously incredibly charming as a pastor, Very. has to be. Mm -hmm. But for his character and for yours, there's a darkness there, right? Yeah. yeah. And that gives the complexity to the, those characters and, and to that movie. So how did you want to approach a character in Trinity mm -hmm. who as I said, it was very funny in, mm -hmm. the, in the film, but also, boy, she was going through stuff. Yeah, just approach these characters with deep compassion. You know, we know that we know the stereotypes of the, the mega church, but what are the human qualities that we really do see? They are trying, they do mm -hmm. love God, and they do love their church. Where it went askew, I'm not sure, and that's not in the movie, but I do believe that they started off smaller. One of my favorite things is when they're showing all their things in the car and they yeah. point to the stay humble. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and it's like, all but right. there's a truth to that because you couldn't point to it if you didn't, and you believe that, but, but at the same time, there are moments where you have deep compassion for them. And you do see that Trinity loves the stuff as much as her husband, but they both are trying. There's an honesty to certain parts of them. There's something I picked up on I'm curious if this was intentional, but the smile and the laugh are there in good times mm -hmm. and bad. Yeah. So you give a little laugh because we have to keep a brave face up when mm -hmm. things are bad. And then you have some genuine laughs yeah. too, right? Yeah. Is that just about, this is for yeah. the church, I'm the first lady? Yes, yeah. That, that was the mask of the first lady. Actually, she even has a, a, a higher pitch and um, an accent when she's first lady. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. It's a performance It's in a, a lot performance, of ways. yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's a commentary in here, Regina, about those kind of mega churches or people who profit off mm -hmm. the gospel? Mm -hmm. Was there something in this film about that? I think it's a discussion. You yeah. know, I think the film shows a lot of things. And I think that there's many discussions that can be had. You know, every institution is worthy of critique and, n and needs evolution at some point. Did it make you think about your own faith? I know you grew up going to church, I yeah. did too, I was mm -hmm. in the choir at my mm -hmm. church. Of course. Did it make you stop and think a little bit about what you were taught growing right. up and maybe how your views have changed mm -hmm. as you got older? I've, I've, I actually did that probably my whole life, mm. you know, even loving the church and even loving so many things about it. There were questions that I just always had, you know, there were things that resonated, you know, as um, incomplete. Yeah. As incomplete. And so, it was great because that leads you to further, you know, exploration or spiritual study or whatever you want or, you know. And I think that's actually Im imperative for faith because it is, you know, your relationship with God is such an individual relationship. Although, you know, I don't know that many people, um, I don't know that every person um, necessarily approaches it that way. Right. They just receive it without right. sort of right. evaluating yeah. it, and well, criticizing and growing yeah. through it. I mean, you can see that with Trinity, which is what I loved. When she did begin to do that, she calls her mother. And you see in that conversation with her mother, yeah. the question she asks her, what it goes right back to. Mm -hmm. And of course, then that is what, that's what she makes. She makes her decision by what that definition is, according to the church, not really her own own fundamental belief system. Do you think Trinity is the hero of this movie? That thought crossed my mind right. a couple of times mm. as I watched it. I don't know if she's the hero. She's not the victim. No. I guess by the end she takes some stance, you know, and maybe even maybe in her world that is still heroic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because she's bottled up and yes. swallowed so much she's, for so long. Oh my goodness. I mean, the thing he has her out there doing, oh. it's, oh. you know, it's, <laughs> why? But yeah, yeah, she does it against her own. Yeah. But you do understand by the end why she does it. I wish I could say more, but there's a scene at the end that people are going to be blown away by. It's, your performance is incredible. It's Thank congratulations you. on it. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. 
Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. We were talking about your youth and church and growing up in D.C. and all of that. We yeah. were just saying a minute ago about you had aspirations to be a journalist. I know. And by the way, I want to thank you because I've read a number of interviews where you've talked about how important the press is and how journalism is important, and that means a lot. So thank you. What was it about journalism that so interests you? I was in school and I read a book. I wonder do you know this book? I don't, I don't remember the author, but it's called Democracy in America. De Tocqueville. Yes. yes. Alexis De Tocqueville. And that, that that book really resonated with me, that yes. if you do not have the press, if you do not have journalism, a free press, then you cannot, have, you cannot maintain democracy. And especially what's going on right now, it couldn't be more evident. And I think reading that, you're like, oh, you start, you, you, I don't know, for me, I don't know, something about that book impressed upon me, like, oh, it's not, it, it's vital. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that people understand how vital it is, even now, because just like, I guess, in a spiritual conversation, I guess in journalism, you'd say you have to have discernment. For the most part, I know that I can trust this yeah. state, this, this, this channel or this paper, right? And then if you didn't, you'd cross-reference it. And now there's so much information because you have social media. Yeah that people read it and they're applying the same principles. Oh, I read it, therefore it must be true. And so now that you see that, that the information is no longer as factual as we've yeah. known it to be for like decades and decades, well, you have the same behavior and, and no one's checking. So it's, it's really tough, but that book, that book. Yeah. I no, would encourage everyone to read that it's, book. It's amazing. And you're, we, people should know you are not a casual and this wasn't a passing interest for you. You no. went to grad school, you went to yeah. NYU, and got your master's in mm -hmm. journalism. Mm -hmm. The news is on constantly, because we had to watch the news for, you know, homework. Like, you had to watch, I mean, you right. watch the news. Right. But I also grew up watching Ted Koppel. I love Nightline, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. But, yes, yeah, so the news plays in my, I mean, but I don't find the news morbid, so it's different. Like, for me, it's not, it's neither good nor bad, it's mm -hmm. information, and right. I like knowing. That's a good way to look at it. Mm -hmm. So how do we get from, I got a master's degree <laughs> in journalism, mm -hmm. to I'm going to be an actress? <laughs> Where did that turn come? You, my father passed away suddenly mm -hmm. in, my first, um, in my first trimester uh, at NYU. NYU has trimesters. Mm -hmm. You say trimester and people think you're pregnant. Right. But good yes, good clarification. First trimester at NYU. And I had a friend who, you know, it was like if you need to earn some extra money, you could do commercials. And that's how I was introduced to it. And I was really bad. I didn't get any commercials at the time. But my father's death, um, I was young, you know, I was, you know, 23. Mm. And I don't think at that age you think about like the brevity of life. You don't, it's not something. And so it was um, sobering. And painful, um, but it, it sort of redirected my journey. You thought, what do I really want out of this life? Yeah. And I was also, it was great because I enjoyed it. And it was such a bright spot in a really, in a really challenging time. Mm. Not all the no's. I mean, that was kind of hard because, you, you know, I had a ton, like so many no's. So many no's. It's like crazy. I mean, I still get a lot of no's, but you like... You don't get a lot of no's. I do get a lot of no's. 
I mean, maybe not a lot, but I get some no's. I still get some no's. Well, mean Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Best Man, that was your first big film. That was my first big film. Studio film. Yes. And is the story true that you may not have been fully prepared for your audition in that you kind of just had one move that you went with? I had one move. That was it. Mm -hmm. I had a move because of the one of the the girls in my acting class what well, used to be an exotic dancer. And I said, I need to learn to dance. And she said, You don't have to know anything. That's you have to do this one move and that's it. And I did that and it and they stopped the music. So it wasn't even like impressive. Right. It wasn't like they even wanted to keep watching it. And they and the, the producer said, Can you do anything else? And I said, Yes. And then I just got my clothes and said thank you and I left. Oh, you walked out? Yes, I said, thank yeah, because I was like, well, I'm not going to get right, it. Right, you thought. And then I, I was it. like, it won't matter. I haven't gotten anything, so it, it won't be shocking to them. <laughs> they were like, at least you got closer. <laughs> and so, yeah, then they called and said, we really liked her, but she left. And they said, well, she's, she, she can't really dance. <laughs> so they hired a choreographer. And which said, is sort of the job, was dancing. Which was, yeah. 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 And if we, they got a choreographer and said, if the choreographer says she can do it, we, we want her. What was that first big studio experience like for you after hearing all those no's just to be right. on the set and to feel okay this is what it's like to make a movie you know you're so excited I didn't even know who was in the movie so you have to remember this is the point where you don't get anything like you don't get the whole script right you just get your sides and you're trying to guess what the movie's about from the sides <laughs> <laughs> but once like it was it, it's nice it was innocent it was like I had a honey wagon and I thought I had the biggest trailer in the world <laughs> my friends came to set and they were like you really made it. <laughs> and then of course now I'm like, wow, I really hadn't. And then, but it was really fun. It was just a warm set. My co-stars were really kind and really warm to me. That, that made a huge difference. And I didn't know about matching. My hands were going all over the place. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you know, we have to edit. <laughs> it's like, uh, so yeah, it was a learning experience. And then from there, you start booking some pretty good jobs. I mean, really yeah. successful movies. Yeah. What did that feel like? That kind of momentum after again hearing all the no's right. to go. Okay, I think I've got something going here. Maybe I it can do was this good. for a living. It was good. It was good. It was that, and then it was Scary love and basketball. And love and basketball. Love and basketball yeah. was second. It was the same producer okay. as the best man. And then I got Scary Movie, and I was like, oh, and she's really this. And he didn't, he was like, Regina, that doesn't sound good. Brenda sounds, and I was telling about, about the role. <laughs> and I was like, but she's so fun, and I love her. And he was like, I don't think you should do it. But of course I did it. Yeah. And yeah, she's wild. I think you made the right call. I think so, I think so. Was there a role or a movie that felt to you like, I've made it? You know, it really is a series. It's, for me, it was more of a, um, 
it was just steady. Yeah. It was the, the steadiness of it. And then it was like, oh. But each role showed a different side of me, so it helped. But people, you know, they remember certain things. Mm -hmm. But I would say it was a combination. And then I would say after Girls Trip, and then the combination of that and support the girls, there was a, yeah. there was a shift. Well, Girls Trip obviously made over mm -hmm. $100 million. It was like yeah. this complete phenomenon. Yeah. What was it about that movie, do you think, that was just so special and so touched a nerve with so many people? I just think, you know, it was a combination of like raunchy fun from women. You know, there was a little this raunchiness, dress. but really heartfelt friendship. Like and each like character's boy, journey, I think a lot of people saw themselves and, anything, you know, like differently in each woman. And I think men were surprised that it was a little bit, <laughs> you know, a little bit racier than they would have thought or sure. that they'd seen women on screen, but it still was honest. But, you know, and it came at a really good timing and it was unexpected. And so yeah. I think because it was unexpected, we had great word of mouth and the movie was able to continue and stay like popular and resonate with like different types of people, different cultures, you know. I think it went a little more across the board than people had anticipated. What is that like if you have that expectation mm -hmm. and, a, and a movie just explodes in that mm -hmm. way? Are you like every weekend seeing those numbers that, oh my gosh. Yeah, it was really surprising. I felt wonderful when I saw women say, I really loved it. And, and like mothers and daughters, mm -hmm. you know, like that it was not, like that it, it was, it was cross-generational. Like that my mom, I, you know, I was really happy that my aunts and my mom loved it. That felt really good to have girls, girls and women like it, and women. And, and we women. can safely say mm -hmm. that there will be another. It's not there yet, but right, there's something that, coming, yeah, right? Yeah, there, it's in the, it's, it's, it's in the oven. So many of your movies are iconic and um, explain and show the black experience mm -hmm. and talk about black culture. Mm -hmm. Do you think about that when you're making a movie or is that just a nice byproduct of the work you do? Well, obviously, you know, the, the black audience, have they've supported me like from the beginning. So, you know, it's like deep, deep in my subconscious, but I don't mm -hmm. know that I think about it directly you know any character whoever it is i always really think about and i mean i am black so i don't know that i think about it because well, it's, it's your experience it's right yeah. and it's also the experience of the world in the story yeah and so i just think about like well where can i expand what's on paper mm. to make the character you know, feel rich. So whether it's in a black film or if it's in like a breaking news in Yuba County or even Nine Perfect Strangers, yeah. it's the person, the person. So where do we have a deeper expansion of the person? Does it feel special when someone comes up and says, thank you for telling my story or telling oh. our story? I haven't seen it up on a screen before. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. I mean, I think anytime anybody says anything nice, it's rewarding. I mean, that's like, that's not a given, that's, you know, like that, you feel that deeply because if they don't do it, you don't, like, you know, why are you here? Why are you bothering? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. in our changing world. Download the NBC News app.
got your own production company, mm -hmm. taking the reins of your mm -hmm. career, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Controlling some production. This film, by the way, Jordan Peele, Daniel Kaluga's yeah. um, production company is mm -hmm. involved there. Mm -hmm. Is that cool for you to put your stamp on a project that when you do it with your production company, say I've got some say in what this is going to look like and who's going to be so. in it and all that? Well, it's nice because, you know, in and of itself, you know, it's a collaborative process, right? So anytime you feel like you know, there's something you can offer to make something better or make something more authentic, whatever the word you want to use is, and then someone like listens and they and you feel valued in that. Yes, it's really great. And it's great to see your little logo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because for so long that part is just a dream. It's not like you're like, oh I want a production company and you get right. it. You know, you've got to really go get it. You've got to earn that too. You've got to have yeah. the clout that your stamp on a project yeah. means something. That's a lot of right. 20, 25 yeah. years of work right, yeah. to get yeah. there. Yeah. You had another incredible validation of your career when you were asked to host the Oscars this year. Oh, what was right. that phone call like when they said, would you come and host the Oscars? That was really scary. <laughs> <laughs> it was scary. It's wonderful, but it's also terrifying. You're like, oh my gosh, that's a, you know, yeah. Especially when you're doing it with two amazing women who are stand-ups, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not right. a stand-up. But they were wonderful and gracious and kind, and so I was, really, I was really fortunate to be able to have both of them. I mean, it was, you know, scary because we're like, well, if it bombs, it's live. <laughs> like, this is it, you know? So you don't know what, well, obviously you don't know what to expect, right? We got yes. the unexpected. Yes. Um, but it was a lot of fun. What was it like to step out there that first time and know like the world's watching, it's the oh three my of gosh. us, we're dressed up, we're ready to go. No matter how much you rehearse, yeah. I imagine that's like a whew, moment. Once you're there, yeah. You yeah. do the carpet and you're like, wow, this is the carpet. And then it's kind of like surreal because you've watched the Oscars, you know, so many times. But I do remember Amy Schumer was like, can we pray? And we held hands and we said a prayer and the door went up and that was kind of it. We should have prayed harder. <laughs> I think, I, think, I think we should have prayed a little harder. Can you imagine it without the prayer? But yeah, and then we, we went out and then, it, and then we had fun. At that point, you just let it go and you just, what works, works, and you're like, we're just gonna, we're gonna go have fun. You were so good. The, the bit you. where you were calling the actors backstage for testing, <laughs> to me, that was what I will remember. That was so good. Since you brought it up, what was it like to be there when the moment happened? What was going on backstage? What were you guys doing? Ironically, in Regina Hall fashion, I had literally gone to my trailer. And so I had missed the commotion, to be honest. And so I did not really know. I will say it was an, an impromptu night as a whole. When I did my bit and the guys walked on stage, that wasn't scripted. Oh, really? Yeah, it was a really fun, interactive night. So as a whole, I don't know that if you were in the audience that anyone knew what was happening or not happening. By the way, it felt that way on TV, too. Like, yeah. Oh, this must be part of the show and yeah. part of the bit. Yeah. So what was your reaction afterward? Well... There are two people and two men who I really respect greatly. I love their work, and I've worked with Chris, and he's great, and you know, I've met Will several times, and he's great, and obviously I've worked in No Jada, so, you know, it was just, um, it wasn't a highest moment for anyone, I don't think. I don't think for him, I don't think for anyone. I think we were all surprised, and you know, my, my, my prayers go to everyone involved in this situation because I'm sure it can't be easy. But I still had a great time. I still feel like all the actors, you know, that we celebrated that night felt great. And like, I still feel really proud of the night as a whole. And you know, life happens. You should be, you were great. Thank you. Were you were great, that's not an easy job. And you, you were really good. As is your movie, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, I'm glad you it's liked so nice it. It's so nice to talk to you. Thank you for this conversation, it was so much Thank fun. You. Thank, Thank you, you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. So this is not your normal office. You, you bought, you're, you're leasing this This place. is my office, actually. <laughs> had, you, had you in. This is your staff? Yeah. <laughs> We joked when you walked in, John, that this was like a deposition. Yeah. Are you a little nervous right I'm now? I'm very I nervous, know. yeah. I, I, I expect to be sued any moment. <laughs> but where's the subpoena? <laughs> You've been in a few rooms like this in your life. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's never a good thing, is it, to be on the other side of the table from a panel that's... No, when you have three lawyers on the other side and they're uh, 
they're all frowning at you and they're trying to, you know, get under your skin and make you say something you don't want to say or make you, you know, that's, that's not, that's not a good way to spend your time. I don't, I don't, I've done that a couple of times, but I, I don't, I don't want to get sued. I've been yeah. sued a lot and you have to deal with it. You know, you, you, they're all frivolous. I've never paid a dime in damages. Uh, but just dealing with the, uh, the negative energy of a yeah. lawsuit. And it's for a guy who claims he came up with the idea for the firm or the Pelican Brief. And Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We That's, still get those letters. Yeah. I did one nonfiction book, The Innocent Man, yeah. and I got sued four times for that one. All frivolous. We won all four of them. But it took two years to get rid of them. Yeah. And you start paying lawyers huh. to sit around tables like this, and they're not cheap, you know. So I would prefer to avoid litigation. Okay, let's do that. So that's the last we will speak of litigation. <laughs> We're done. Talk, fun to talk about. We are done. There, there are here. no pending suits right now. <laughs> Maybe that's why you got out of the law and got into this stuff, right? A lot, a lot of reasons. Writing books. A lot of reasons. Books. Sparring Partners is a novella, which is new for you, John. There are three stories, about mm. 125, something like that, pages, each of them. Why did you decide to take that approach this time? The stories, all three stories have been around for a while. And uh, I keep a lot of stories. And my, my usual novel is about 400 pages. That's what yeah. I like to read. These were not quite that long. There was not, not quite enough characters or action or plot in these three stories. So in an effort to get the, books, the stories published, and I love the stories, so let's, let's publish them as three novellas. One of them takes place in three hours, mm. Kid on Death Row. Yeah. They're just stories that have been around. And it's time to publish them. One of the stories in here, Strawberry Moon, is you mentioned it, it takes place over the course of a few hours, guy on death row. Wow. And I note that it ties into the work you do in your life as well with the Innocence Project and something that's important to you. Um, what did you want to say in that story in Sparring Partners? Up until about 10 or 12 years ago, the Supreme Court finally ruled that you cannot put minors on trial for capital murder. It's not fair. And the Supreme Court finally said, uh, stop it. Uh, in this story, the kid went, on, went, to, he went to trial at the age of 14, I think, for capital murder. He's found guilty. He's been on death row for 15 years. He's going to be executed at the age of 29, which is very young for a death row inmate to be, to be killed. So the first issue is trying minors for capital crimes. The second one is, uh, in this story, the kid didn't kill anybody. He never pulled a trigger. He was an accomplice. His brother pulled the trigger. And the point is, uh, just because you're an accomplice doesn't mean you should be executed. You should be punished severely. But he never pulled the trigger. He didn't kill anybody. And that law is, that's not the law in every state, but in the majority of states. So I, I touched on the law a little bit there. But also, I've been to death row in like six states. And those are not always fun visits. And I'm kind of fascinated by, by those stories and what an inmate goes through in the final few hours and, and how they go about it, how the state goes about it, and the last minute appeals and the last minute, the last meal, the last words. You know, we're, we're, we're rapidly approaching the point in this country where the death penalty is dying. Uh, there's so few executions now. There's so, there's so few death verdicts from juries. Uh, it will eventually go away. You Not, think so? It'll go away? Yeah, well, uh, in most places. Virginia yeah. abolished it two years ago, became the first southern state to do so in many years. What's happening is um, it's just juries, juries just don't want to do it. Juries get to see the whole picture now. They get to see uh, the horrible crime that, that deserves severe punishment. They also get to see the defendant and where he came from and what his, how he reached that point. And, and so there's more sympathy now for, for someone who was raised like that. And so juries nowadays are much more willing to go life without parole, without killing the person. Your work with the Innocence Project, I gather is nearly as meaningful to you as writing a best-selling book. How important is that work to you? Well, it's very important because I never knew there was a problem. Even mm -hmm. as a small town criminal defense lawyer, uh, I never had a client I thought was wrongfully convicted or, or mistreated. I, I was naive. When I wrote The Innocent Man and I had to research the issue, I realized that there are tens of thousands of innocent people in prison. And most people don't believe that, uh, but it's true. And we're trying to get them out one at a time. I'm pen pals with some guys uh, in prison. 
uh, still uh, one guy in Oklahoma has been there for 35 years. And um, we're trying to get him out, completely innocent. And uh, it's heartbreaking. It's, those, sto those stories stay with me. And as a storyteller, uh, they are fascinating stories because of the amount of uh, injustice, suffering. Any, anywhere you have great suffering, you have great fiction. But the wrongful convictions are exonerations, the ultimate uh, triumph after 30 years of walking out of prison uh, and being able to survive in the world and while somebody else was roaming free, while the real rapist or the real killer was out there. Uh, it's, it's very gratifying, but it's also uh, bittersweet because it happened and it could have been prevented initially. Sweet because you're getting the guy out after a long time. Uh, but the work is um, it's pretty addictive. And a lot of times it's because the guy or the woman didn't have money to hire a lawyer who could prevent him from going in there for 30 years. It's all so much socioeconomic undercurrent you to all see, those cases. You don't, you don't see any rich people on death row. Yeah. And, and oftentimes, uh, bad lawyering is a, is a cause of the wrongful, wrongful conviction. We try, to, we try to fight for better legal representation for people charged with serious crimes. We, we all believe in a fair trial. We, we are, we're Americans. Let's have a fair trial. Let's, uh, let's have a trial. Let's make it fair. Uh, but they're rarely fair because the state has all the resources. We fight to provide adequate representation for, for our clients. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. You were so fluent in the language of not only the law, but the shady side of the law. I'm not suggesting you were shady as an attorney, John. But did you see something along the way that you sort of stored away and said, these are the kind of characters I'm going to write about? somewhere in your legal career or just observing oh, sure. lawyers? Oh, sure. I, I watch lawyers, and, uh, and they're fascinating. I always have. Uh, small town guys, big firm guys are really uh, intriguing. The conflicts, the bad behavior, the law firms that blow up, the conflicts of interest. The uh, lawyers are always doing things that, um, that are hard to believe. And I, I've said a thousand times, most lawyers are honest, hardworking people who don't make a lot of money. They're boring. Nobody wants to read about that, okay? You want to read about the guy who cracks up and does something really crazy. And that's what's fun to write about and fun to read about. Jake is my favorite, you know, in, in, from, from Ford County. And I hope I go back there one day with Jake again to tell another courtroom drama. I love the courtroom as a spectator, <laughs> not as a defendant. <laughs> I like to, to write about um, courtroom dramas and the intrigue and the jury deliberations and the judges and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's, where, that's my world. That's where I like to live. Still, after 40 books, I still enjoy it. So fun for your fans to see Jake back. There are no more points of law to argue here. I, I want to cop a plea. It'll take him back to a time to kill, and they'll think of yeah, Matthew McConaughey that. and all those yeah. things that really launched you to where you are right now. Did you love sitting down with him again and putting him in a new place? Jake was a very autobiographical character. Yeah. When I wrote the story 35 years ago, 
I was that small town lawyer in Mississippi, very idealistic, dreaming of the big case, the big courtroom drama that would, you know, establish me as a, as a badass trial lawyer. Uh, that was the dream, never happened. But I wrote that story from that point of view. Matthew took it to a whole this different level. You now have the opportunity to work on a case that matters. Matthew became Jake because the movie was so popular and he was so good in the movie. And um, I waited 20 some odd years before I brought Jake back in a, a book called Sycamore Row. And we were pleasantly surprised at the reception that Jake got the second time he came back. And uh, not only by uh, critics, reviewers, but also by the, by the sales numbers. People really uh, like Jake. And most of that's because of Matthew. Uh, he, he made Jake famous. And after reviewing the sales numbers from Sycamore <laughs> Row, I said, I'm not going to wait 24 <laughs> years again. Uh, so I brought him back last year, two years ago, with a book called Time for Mercy, which is a really brutal uh, courtroom murder case. And um, I've since realized that Jake is very popular. He makes an appearance in uh, Homecoming this, for the first story in Sparring Partners, uh, not in the courtroom, but as a friend who um, is helping a buddy try to return to town. But there, there's enough of Jake. He'll be back, uh, hopefully, uh, sometime soon. The challenge with Jake is that you want to see him in court. You want to see the courtroom drama. And a small town guy in Mississippi can only have so many big cases. He's not, <laughs> right, right. not going to have a, ma a massive courtroom drama every other week, you know. Uh, so he's also growing up. He's maturing. His family's growing up. And so uh, there'll be, hopefully, no, at least one more Jake novel. I love your relationship with Matthew because that movie came along at a time. People forget he was not well known as an actor at all. And you were kind of getting off the ground. The firm had, yeah. had blown up, but you were still rising yourself. It's fun to watch two guys who've reached sort of the zenith of their fields grow up together in a way. Yeah, well, with a contract for A Time to Kill, uh, I didn't sell the film rights for a long time. The first wave of movies came out. The Firm, The Pelican Brief, The Client, Chamber was not a big movie, Rainmaker with Matt mm -hmm. Damon. Those movies came out in the early 1990s, and I wouldn't sell A Time to Kill. And finally, Joel Schumacher, who did The Client, convinced me to sell um, the film rights, and he was going to do A Time to Kill. And, and I said, okay, but I'm going to have veto power over some of this casting. I, I don't want to make the movie. I don't know how to make movies. I'm not going to write the screenplay. But I'm very protective of the character Jake and a couple of others in the book. And so I, I, I retained the absolute right to veto casting, which is very rare. But they gave it to me. And we got ready to film the movie, and we didn't have a star. And the money was on the table, and... Uh, couldn't go wrong, filming it in Mississippi with no star. And so they, they, they called Matthew in for a quick screen test and filmed him sitting in the office smoking a cigar. And then back in the old days, they, they FedExed me the cassette overnight. They stuck it in the machine, and there was Matthew. And uh, the accent was perfect because that's the way he talks, being from Texas. Charismatic, great-looking guy. Renee's first reaction was, I think I'm in love with him. <laughs> He said, I think we've got our guy. Yeah, that's our guy. A lot of the inspiration for the characters I know comes from the way you grew up, where you grew up, some people you knew. Um, it was humble. It was pretty modest. Uh, yeah. My father was a cotton farmer in rural Arkansas, and uh, it was a pretty hard life. Uh, a lot of kids in the family. But at the same time, I had two parents who were devoted to each other, and they were always there. And uh, we didn't have much. We didn't realize that. But the farming got to the point where dad just couldn't, he never made a living. Mm. He lost crop after crop. And so he finally, he fled the farm. We, we fled the farm in the middle of the night with, I think, some unpaid bills. Right? By the time I was, you know, 15 years old, life had, had improved greatly for us uh, through my dad's hard work. Uh, so, but, you know, I, and I captured that story in a book called A Painted House yeah. that came out 20 years ago. And I, I wanted to write that book while my parents were still alive because they were my resources. And we had a lot of fun doing that book, but it was, it was very uh, autobiographical, very accurate. And that, but that's where I came from. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now.
and good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I'm not sure everybody knows the, the backstory of the book, A Time to Kill. You were an attorney. As you say, small town attorney looking for your big case. What made you think you could sit down and write a book that people might read about your experience having watched that trial in 1984 yeah. that motivated you to sit down and write? I had no idea what I was doing. I had never written before. I had never thought about writing. It was not a childhood dream. It was not something I studied in college. It was just uh, this obsession with a courtroom drama that I had sort of cooked up, inspired by something I really saw, but changed a bunch of the facts. And I, the more I thought about this courtroom drama, uh, the more complicated it became, the more layers there were to it. And, and I finally said, okay, I'm gonna see if I can write this. And uh, that started a process that went on for three years, which is not a long time in the course of writing a novel when you have a real job and you have other responsibilities. We had, you know, I was practicing law. I was in the state legislature in yeah. Mississippi. Renee's having babies. You know, life was got kind of complicated. Um, but I, I hung with it. I hung with it for, uh, for three years. And it, in my spare time, wherever I, I, I kept the current, it was all handwritten on legal pad. And after about a year and a half, I realized I was halfway through with my story as I envisioned it, the, 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 the drama. And we had not yet got to the courtroom. I kept plugging away. Renee was reading it. Uh, she was very encouraging, you know, keep going. No one knew about it but the two of us. Mm -hmm. And I had no grand plans to, you know, get it published when I finished. Um, it just, one thing led to the, and finally I was finished. And uh, the, the trial was over, the verdict was in. And uh, it was about a thousand pages. Uh, my secretary typed it, began sending it to New York, back and forth, the old submission, rejection, long before the internet. And I uh, finally found an agent who uh, liked it enough to, after a bunch of them said no, he took the book and he made the rounds in New York and the same folks who'd already said no to me said no to him. <laughs> so it got two looks. And then finally we found a small press to publish it. It came out in June of 1989 and they printed 5,000 hardback copies, and I bought 1,000 of them. And I, I didn't have any money, but I had more than my publisher. And, uh, At least you're honest about that. People do buy their own books. <laughs> yeah, I'd give them away. Yeah. They were stacked up in my office. Most of my clients couldn't afford a book, so I just gave them the book. Uh, but it was a wonderful time. And at the, also, at the same time, um, I got myself into the habit of writing every day. I tell students, if you want to write, do it every day. You don't dream about it, just do it. And I had this idea for the second book, or, or another book, uh, that I really liked, and Renee really liked it. She thought it was much more accessible, much more commercial, mm. and that was The Firm. And when The Firm came out in uh, March of 1991, over 30 years ago, 
things changed uh, overnight. I was suddenly bored with the law, <laughs> bored of the politics. I said, okay, I'm going to write. I'm going to, the dream has come true. I can write full time. And because it was purchased, right, the movie rights before it even came out, did you have a sense when somebody bought those rights that this was going to change everything for you? Did it feel like a big moment? We had uh, three big studios bidding for the film rights. At the last minute, somebody said, hey, should we check with the writer? So they call me at the last moment. Uh, I had no clue. There was no book deal. I wasn't sure the book was going to get published. Wow. And then once we got the movie deal, the publishers woke up <laughs> in New York, and everybody wanted the book. Did you and Renee have a moment? I mean, there are moments along the way I know with my wife where you go, wow, life is changing a little bit for us. This is exciting. We built this together. Do you remember that moment? Oh, yes. We've had several great moments. But when I hung up the phone, and I told Renee what the deal was for the film rights. Uh, we were due to go to my mother's house for Sunday, Sunday lunch. We both grew up in very uh, conservative, tight, Southern Baptist households, okay? A lot of rules. Uh, one rule was you never talked about family money outside the family. We'll talk about selling the film rights, but we are never going to discuss the money. First thing Monday morning, Paramount Pictures issued a press release with all the details in it. Oh. So it took a couple of days for that to get back to our hometown and that changed everything. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. And who's this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. And who's this? Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You know, I've always wanted to sit and talk with you because I was in high school when The Firm came out. I remember flipping through that and saying, oh, this is fun. This is fun. Reading is fun. Do you appreciate the impact you've had on people reading when you've sold 350 million books on making reading accessible and exciting and fun for people who may not otherwise have stepped through that door? Yeah, it's hard to gauge the impact that, uh, that you may have on people. Uh, but, but a lot of people have said nice things, just like you just said something nice about enjoying the reading got a pretty good feel for, you know, what it has meant to certain people. I have a lot of faithful readers, and they want that big legal thriller every October. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to come through as long as I can. Uh, they'll, they'll tolerate me writing something else, a baseball novel or the kids' books mm -hmm. or uh, a funny story like Skipping Christmas, but they want that legal thriller every October. And those fans have been loyal for 30 years now. I want to give those people the best book they've had yet the best reading experience they've had yet. And that's my goal. I stay motivated to give them every time out. You know, it's hard to, uh, to get my head around uh, 300 million books in 50 languages. It's always a fun moment when we're traveling somewhere, some out of the way place, and you sit at a little bookstore and you'll see a book in another language uh, or a big bookstore in, you know, in Europe, European cities to see a Grisham shelf, you know, and mm -hmm. yeah, we always stop and point and smile and make a joke and, and keep going. Years ago when things were getting really crazy and there was a 
three or four year period, 91, 92, 93, when the books were coming out, but also the movies were coming out. And life was really, um, we were losing privacy that we realized um, how much we cherished our privacy. And uh, so we, we, you know, we were making adjustments in life, but we, we sat down one time and we said, look, this is, everything in popular fiction is temporary. You know, nothing's gonna last forever. Whether it's, whether it's books or TV or movies or sports or fashion or whatever, in, 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 in the popular, you know, popular culture, um, nobody stays on top forever. It's, it's all a temporary career. One of these days, the books are not gonna be as popular as they are now. Things are gonna change. And when that happens, let's, let's admit it and realize it. Let's be able to look back and say, it was a heck of a ride. We had a lot of fun and we didn't change. Mm -hmm. Kept our feet on the ground. We raised great kids, and and so we're still we're still we're still waiting for the <laughs> the books are still selling. <laughs> the books are still popping. You mentioned your process that you start on January the first, mm -hmm. wake up, time for a new book. Mm -hmm. You want to end it by July the first. I note by the clock that I'm eating into your writing time. I've got it. Seven a.m. I got a month. I got a month. Is it those fans that keep you getting up every New Year's Day to write a new one, or are there ever moments where you go, gosh, I'm Take a year off. I've done enough of these. I've thought about taking a year off. The motivation is, uh, again, after writing for 35 years, it's a daily habit. And, there, and there's, there's nothing else I can find to do in, in the morning between 7 and 11, 7 and 12. <laughs> I can't fill those hours any other way that I've found yet. Uh, so that's, I still cherish the, those moments, the early morning hours, going to my little writing cabin, with no phones, no fax, no music, no internet, no interruptions, and being able to create stories that bring a lot of pleasure to a lot of people. I could have quit 20 years ago, uh, but it's, so it's not about money. It's about being able to entertain and bringing pleasure to a lot of people. Uh, I still get a kick out of that. Are you like the rest of us? Do you stare at the screen some days and there's just nothing coming? You just drink your coffee and look at it, walk some, away? <laughs> <laughs> some days are slower than others. No, my, my goal every day is a thousand words. A thousand a day. Yeah, a thousand a day. I don't stare for long. Also, when I start the book, I've got a pretty good outline, so I know what's going to happen next. And uh, again, I tell aspiring writers, uh, you can waste a lot of time if you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And if you always know where you're going, um, it's hard to get lost. And you know the end before you start. That's one of my rules of writing popular fiction. Don't write the first scene until you know the last scene. Mm. I, I talked to John Irving in Toronto a couple years ago and I said, is it true that you've said that you write the last sentence before you write the first one? And he said, that's true. Wow. I said, I'm not that smart, <laughs> but I, I do know the last scene before I start. You ever see a day, John, where you stop, you say, I've done it. I've sold all the books I'm gonna sell. I've given the people what they want for 30 some years. I'm done. I can't see that day yet. Uh, I'm only 67 years old. Uh, if I stay healthy and, and stay you know, inspired creatively, I hope I can do it for a long time. Um, but again, I can't, I've, le I've learned, um, learned a few things. Y you never can predict what's gonna happen next. You can't worry about what's already happened. And you know, never say never. I I've said, I'll, I'll never write that story again. Well, I wrote it. So I've learned that, you know, be careful what you say. I'm not gonna say I'm never gonna retire, um, but I think there comes a time with some writers I've always admired, you know, as they get up in the years, it's time to quit. I, ho I hope I have the sense to do that. And I, I get pretty good advice at home. Well, I hope it keeps going. I hope you wake up every January 1st and, and keep writing the books. We, we love it. It's great to see you. Thank you, Willie. My pleasure. Thanks, good seeing you. Take Thank care. you. Just call when you need them most. Ooh, let it go. Thanks for doing this, John. Oh, my pleasure. This is so much fun Thanks to be out here me. talking about this truly extraordinary project, Prehistoric Planet. I say extraordinary because of the scale of ambition, both in what you're trying to capture 66 million years ago and how you're trying to do it in terms of the filmmaking. Right. So how did you embark on this? You gotta kinda walk it back to the collaborations I had on the live action Disney 
animated updates, you know, like The Jungle Book, Lion King. We had a whole team that we assembled for those two films to try to figure out how to do really naturalistic performances and depictions and creating new, you know, rendering tools and simulations and all the things that create the magic trick that makes all these illusions look real, which is really, really what filmmaking is, right? When we were working on uh, The Jungle Book and Lion King, we were figuring out how to make these animals come to life. We had a, a whole workflow and a way to create things using a combination of virtual reality and game engine technology, a lot of cutting edge stuff. When they reached out to me through Apple to collaborate with the BBC on this project, it seemed like a great uh, uh, application for what we had been developing for so long. And we had really been studying planet Earth and all of the, what you might call the Attenborough mm -hmm. uh, documentaries because we were trying to look for reference for photorealism. And so we started to collaborate, figuring out how they did documentaries in, in the real world and how we created the you know, photoreal artificial world. And by bringing those two, those two traditions together, we, I think, achieved something that, was, uh, that I don't think would have been possible uh, at, an, at any uh, earlier of the time or with a different group of people. It just feels like a documentary. Like you've got cameras 66 million years ago. I know it's a long explanation, but photorealism, what is it? How do you pull that off? Well, there's lots of tricks, things like ray tracing. You create a simulation around the way light bounces around and off of different surfaces. It creates the illusion of real light hitting a real object. Simulations, how fur, or in this case, feathers react, how they react off of one another, how they react to environments. In Jungle Book and Lion King, we created completely uh, vir virtual environments. We, you know, everything was created through CGI. But in this case, because we're working with the BBC and we're working with producers who had worked on documentaries, they actually went out in the field and shot plates in those real environments. And so we put our artificial dinosaurs into those real environments. And thanks to the technology that's available, we could make it integrate, you know, I think to a very high standard. And then there's sort of the educational side of it, which is you have to get the facts right about yeah. every one of these dinosaurs. I learned so much from working with these paleontologists and people who are experts in the field. Because I would, you know, my first thing was when they present me with different story ideas for each vignette, I'd say, that seems like a reach. And they'd, they'd explain to me why there's actual uh, scientific backing in the latest learnings. And we are in a golden age now of paleontology. Uh, in archaeology because we keep finding new specimens all around the world. For example, the eyes on dinosaurs, uh, they could tell by, from fossil remains that they were probably very sensitive to not just movement but color. You know, in Jurassic Park, it was like, don't move, it can't see you. But in reality, they have eyes more like bird's eyes. Mm -hmm. And because they can perceive color, there's a lot of speculation as to the coloration that dinosaurs would have had. And we're starting to see that there's plumage as well. So the combination of feathers, crests, and very sensitive eyes to color makes you realize that there's pr there was probably more like the bird world than what we see. So there, there, there may very well have been spectacular coloration on these animals. Now, of course, what we do in the show is we don't want to break out that hard away from expectations. And so there are leaps that we make that are plausible and to the most part agreed upon by the whole scientific community. And so I actually learned a lot about, about the science. It's one of those weird ironies that the older that you get, the more you wish you were still yeah. in school. Totally. <laughs> you really want to learn. Yeah. And so to me, it was um, just a wonderful education with the top people in the field. Well, you sound pretty fluent at this point in paleontology. Did you come to this with a fascination with dinosaurs or was this fully a learning experience No, I just you? like, di I mean, dinosaurs are fun, I guess, you know. It, it's interesting because every new technology in cinema seems to be drawn to dinosaurs first. Everybody seems to, as soon as they have something new they could do, they want to use it to bring dinosaurs to life. Mm -hmm. There's something just fascinating about, I think, the scale and they feel like fantasy creatures and the fact that they really walk the earth where we are. And that they were here for so long is the other thing that I never realized. It just puts things in perspective. It's somewhat, somewhat humbling when you think of us as this dominant species on the planet, realize that we're just a blip. It can lead to an existential crisis when you think about that, how insignificant we actually it's are. Good. It's good. Yeah. You have to see yourself as, you know, the most important center of the universe, but also an insignificant speck at the same time. Right. And if you could balance those two things, it kind of prepares you for, for life's challenges and puts a proper perspective on things. Totally. One of the things that strikes me watching the series 
is that it might change the way people feel about dinosaurs, at least some uh -huh. dinosaurs. In some scenes, like a T-Rex, for example, is sympathetic. Did you think when you embarked on this, or maybe later when you saw it, like, oh, this may be shown in middle schools or high oh, schools sure. and educate people oh, yeah. about what these animals really were? Yeah, you know, I mean, something interesting that I've learned from, from my conversations with, with George Lucas that I've been lucky enough to have is as a storyteller, he's constantly reminding uh, us of the fact that you know, stories were really created for, for primarily for people coming of age. Like that's what that's what the myth, the tradition of the myth is, the monomyth, the hero's journey. Primarily, it's about going from childhood to adulthood, and you know the the challenges that come with that threshold. And so, two aspects I really like about this particular project. One is that you get to empathize with a really relatable story with these with these fantastic creatures that are not human but yet go through all of the challenges that survival and you know ha family and traveling from one biome to another mm -hmm. in search of food or to have uh, the next generation and lay their eggs and so there's that very sort of relatable uh, story about just the challenges associated with life done in a way that's because it's in an arm's distance it it's allows you to accept the themes of it because you're not really scrutinizing it. And on the other hand, I think it's also great because you're hopefully hitting people at an age, kids at an age when they're first being introduced to science and first being introduced to this, how much is available to them uh, if their curiosity is uh, engaged. I think the older I get, the more I realize that if you could you'll never be more productive than if you find a career that you have excitement and passion around. I thought of myself as a lazy person before this because I wouldn't work as hard on my schoolwork as I should. And, but there were always things that I was engaged by that I would be obsessively you know, uh, thinking about or working at. And if you could line up your passions with what you're doing as a career, all of a sudden you're engaging on a, on a much more productive level. What you want to do is present all of these options to young people and expose them to things that might inspire them. And the whole, you know, the idea of paleontology or, or the STEM fields in general or science for kids to get uh, intrigued by it is, you know, one of those kids might be the next paleontologist. So in, in that way, I feel that there's like a, a, lot, of, a lot of good that could come out of it. But selfishly, I just loved working on it. And cool to use your name and your success and your platform for something like this. You know, um, between the BBC, Pl Planet Earth, David Attenborough, yeah. you know, the, that mixture, uh, and, and Apple, I felt like I was in very good company and it wasn't uh, relying on me. But people hopefully saw my contributions and understood that, that this is something I've been working at for a long time and this is the pinnacle of everything that I learned up to now. Yeah, bringing all your experience to it. You mentioned David Attenborough. Yeah. It feels like to me it had to be him. He's very involved and, and want, is very curious about the science and wants to make sure that, that his name being on it is uh, that he's vetted the, the content. For me, when I first heard his voice over, it was when I really felt like, okay, now we've got it. The battle will be resolved not by surprise, but by strategy. And of course, Hans Zimmer and yeah. his company Bleeding Fingers, their music coming into it, also connected it with the Planet Earth documentaries. So the whole package really worked quite well. It was just such a refreshing change of pace to be transported to this world. It's something that maybe different generations might come together and share one screen. That becomes, uh, I, I know I have three kids I really value. If there's something we all want to check out together, Definitely. that's rarer and rarer to actually be focused on something together and discuss it. Is, um, is a real treat that I don't take for granted as a, as a parent. That's the piece of it too, the conversation after. Um, you mentioned Hans Zimmer, the score is amazing. My one complaint is every time the music is uplifting, mm -hmm. I'm feeling good about a dinosaur, the score changes. Yes. And Attenborough says, but a predator <laughs> yes. is lurking. Yes. And I go, oh no, we're gonna lose the hatchling, aren't we? No, it's hard because <laughs> the science has to be real and just because you could control everything doesn't mean that you can manipulate the, right. the reality of it. Join us for a story you've never heard on a scale you've never witnessed. There are wonderful moments and then there are, there are sad moments. In, in, certainly, in, you see it in sharp detail in, in 
you know, in the natural world. And, you know, the human condition isn't that far off. Good stories know how to incorporate all of that and contextualize it. And ultimately, hopefully, in a way that makes you think, but this is, it's, it's so beautiful in spite of all of that. I think that those documentaries, when they're done well, really capture that in a way that put you through it, but then ultimately make you feel like you're very blessed to be seeing this beautiful world and being a part of it. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So I'm curious, John, where this love of films and filmmaking comes from. Because obviously you started as an actor before yeah. you became this huge director. To so go back to Queens? I think I always liked movies. I was an only child. My folks were split, so I remember spending a lot of time with my dad. And he loved movies, I loved movies. I was lucky enough to be able to be a short drive from Manhattan where there were revival mm -hmm. theaters and there was always uh, theaters with a curated slate. So there'd be old classic films and my dad would always, if he saw something cool that he thought I'd like, he'd, he'd bring me to them and we'd watch movies a lot. And, and I think I always loved storytelling I always thought that was cool, and, and I also like to perform, like I like being on stage and school plays and things, so that combo, now of course I never thought it was something I would do, uh, it's just something I liked. It wasn't until I was like 22 years old that I decided to even try to, you know, try, even try acting or being in anything in the entertainment field as a, as a profession. And that's when I, I moved to Chicago and I started doing comedy there and learning and taking classes and learning improvisation. So I really got to be on the outside for a long time looking in so that by the time I actually got into a position where I was making a living there and that was my career, I felt very grateful. You talk about putting the idea in your head of becoming a performer. You were knocking around a little after high school, mm -hmm. working a Wall Street job I don't yeah, think right. you loved. Then you make the natural leap from Bear Stearns to Second City. Of course. Just right. the way it's done in show business. I'd gone cross country. So I had stopped in Chicago yeah. and saw people performing on stage. and. You know, I think uh, the, the first night I went to watch a, a, a live show was Chris Farley on stage. And wow. I was like, these people are good here. <laughs> I didn't realize I was looking at a generational talent. I was like, geez, this is intimidating. You know, and I love that there was an audience that would show up to, to look at an unscripted comedy show and that it would come together and that they would figure out how to tell stories. And I thought that was fascinating. And so I learned a lot of lessons. And there's nothing like learning a lesson in front of a crowd and, uh, you know, if you could win over that crowd, like that's, it's a good, yeah. you know, it's good. You know, everything that I do, I still have in the back of my mind, what, how is a live audience going to react? That's so fascinating how even that plays into what you do now. I all think those it years all is, ago, right? it's built in and they're all steps up the it's ladder. Even, and also, by the way, I love being an audience member too. Like it doesn't have to always be me doing it. Boy, if there's a good show that somebody's like, oh, you got to check the series out, I savor it. I savor it. Like I love a good story. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. 
These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. You were talking about different generations know you from different things yes. before we started yeah. here. And for me, it's swingers. Uh -huh. uh, so you get Rudy. You're in uh -huh. a big movie. Right. You think, here we go. Career is about Vince. to take off. You met, met Vince, Vince there. He was always a just incredibly entertaining guy and funny and quick. And to be introduced to Hollywood coming from New York and then Chicago, that experience was, was somewhat you know, inspiring of the script. I want you to remember this face here, OK? This is the guy behind the guy behind the guy. And so that was the thing that got us the attention, you know, all of us respectively, but me more so as a, as a writer especially. And after Swingers, I was hired to do a lot of rewrites and things, most of which were films that were just in development, many of which never got made. But I was making an income from doing writing. And that allowed me to not have to work or struggle and even able to get my first house. And so, like, I felt a certain amount of security in that. And, and also the sense that, hey, if I'm making a living doing this, then maybe I belong here. Because there's always the thing hanging over your head, like, should I, should I go home? Did we give it a good run and it's not working out? You know? But clearly I could tread water here and do well and then learn from every collaboration. And then finally, when I was, you know, with Elf, then it became a different thing. Now you really want to be careful not to, now that a lot of opportunities are coming your way, then you have to say, okay, so what do I really connect with the most? What do I feel the most for? What do I want to get involved with? And I found over the course of many films, I was being drawn to the, the technological aspects of it. Mm -hmm. I think my youngest self, the part of me that was the most pure, was the one that was drawn to the first time I saw King Kong, you mm -hmm. know, Star Wars, Close Encounters. And I wanted to learn how to do all those tricks. I just loved those tricks. I wanted to see how they made the puppets come to life. And, and now I was getting to meet people who worked on that kind of stuff. And you go to their shops and you go to ILM for the first time and you see all the miniatures and you see models and matte paintings. And, and it really felt special. And so I did a little bit of visual effects in Elf because so I was doing stop motion. And every film I've done, some of them missed, some of them hit. But there was always different layers of complexity I was finding in the rearview mirror. I was like, boy, I'm really building towards technology. I was a bit resistant to CGI until Iron Man when I really started to say, okay, CGI is another paint in my paint box here. And then we started to challenge things to make it even organic materials, more photoreal like in Jungle Book and Lion King. And then as I do The Mandalorian and as I work on the Star Wars properties for Disney Plus, you know, there we have a lot of other level of innovation where we're using video walls and using game engine technology and in-camera final pixel visual effects. And you know, all the CG started with 
all the work that Lucas had done. And so I find myself, you know, now not just learning from the people who've done it, but innovating with the people and breaking through to the next level of what can be achieved. And so this collective, this creative collective that forms around a, a television show like that, at this point in my life and my career is really, really rewarding. In television, it feels very much like you're, um, it's almost like an academy at times. Like you have people coming in, people graduating out, people returning back to work. And that to me is uh, exciting and rewarding because I get to see the whole new crop with new voices and new perspectives keeping me fresh while I'm in, you know, able to pass down some of what I was able to learn to the people who really want to know how to do it and I could help balance them and give them the tools at least as best as I can for my, for my experience. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Who mean Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? It feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. It's interesting hearing you talk about Iron Man, Elf, and swingers because people may not realize that as big a hits as they are in enduring classics, none of those three was a sure thing. No, at, at, the, at time. the time, right? No. I mean, swingers was your story, you and Vince, yeah, and you yeah, wrote yeah. it up, and who knows what's going to happen. And the next thing you know, people are wearing and suits, by the way, suits all the time. Was not a hit in the theaters, <laughs> right? At all, but it made a, it made enough of a cultural splash that it got us, right? You know, hey, who are those guys? So, right, and that's you need a lot of breaks. And you got to be ready for them. And that certainly was a big one for us. But, but honestly, just getting into Rudy was a big break. Yeah. Just getting me an agent, like, that was a big step. And that movie didn't do that great in the theaters either, but it stood the test of time. You know, there's so many movies been made, so many TV shows. There are only a few that, that people keep with them and want to return to. Like Elf, one of the most rewarding aspects of it is on TV every year. Yep. That's a big deal to be part of, like, that, those Christmas, that special set of Christmas movies that people return to the nostalgia of it. I have big hits, but I also have big flops. And I think it, it, it's been, um, it's a good, it's been a good balance because you need, you need the, you need to trip over your feet sometimes to learn. That's when you learn, you don't learn on the hits. People who are fans of yours since swingers who followed your career, they root for you. I remember it was like, whoa, Favreau's doing Iron Man. And then, you know, and then it was like all the way Why? up. The Mandalorian. <laughs> no, but it was like our guy from Swingers. Yes. It's like he made it. Like we went through it with you or something. Do you have moments where you stop, John, and you're like, you and Vince knocking around LA oh, back sure. in the 90s sure. and now here you are doing projects like this? The whole thing's very surreal. And the places I've gotten to go, the people I've gotten to meet, people that I you know, really looked up to and idolized, and then you get to meet them as real people. It's all, it's all very strange. And just the amount of travel I've gotten to do. And I looked at my passport now, because I just see all the stamps and how lucky I've been to go to all the different, you know, most of the continents in the, in the world. But everywhere I go, there's, there's probably somebody who knows who I am, and I never feel like I'm uh, alone. I always feel like, I always see somebody looking at me and, and know that they know who I am. And that feels like you got a friend everywhere. Yeah. Um, even in countries where you don't speak the language, mm -hmm. it's, it, they, they, they know at least a version of me from either my acting work or some people, because they like Star Wars, or like Marvel. 
But as an actor, being a character actor throughout so many of those titles, I really feel like I could have a continuous presence, especially with kids who've grown up watching those movies. Remember, that's how I started. I started off as a character actor. Yeah. You know, when I moved to Chicago, that was the goal. And so to still be connected to that part of it, I feel very grateful for that as well. We are talking about your dad before we started. Yeah. As you describe this run you've had, I'm thinking about him taking you to those little movie houses in Manhattan. Oh, my dad's really What does he happy. think about all this? Oh, he's, 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 um, I'm very lucky he's around and, you know, vital and young enough to enjoy it and travel and come with me to a lot of these things and premieres and festivals. And he's been really there the whole time. It's a nice thing. We don't always get that. My mom passed away when I was very yeah. young, you know? You're lucky when you have it. And, and I think that's kind of the... The big takeaway is like, it doesn't, none of this stuff, none of this stuff lasts forever, you know? You're here for a limited time. That you just gotta get the most out of it and, and appreciate. I feel like I'm at the point in my career too where I've done, you know, everything I work on now is just like, is this gonna be interesting and exciting? Is this gonna be fun? Because it's really, there's a generational shift happening now. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm relevant because I'm, you know, still working and I'm relevant because I could teach others and, but I really feel like there's a new generation coming up that's, it's their turn. And so um, that's also part of it. Like, how do you fit into that? I have to ask you, did you have any idea what you were creating when you came up with Baby Yoda? How Baby big Yoda, it was gonna yeah. Be? It wasn't like I said, hey, let me make a show about Baby Yoda. It was like, again, I was like, okay, here's the bounty hunter. He only knows that it's 50 years old. And like, that could be really cool if the big reveal is he thinks he's going after a 50 year old and it's a baby. You stay right here. You stay, don't move. You understand? Yoda is such a, of course, like one of those characters where you don't know that much about. George Lucas always kept a mystery around that character, where that character was from, but also a character with tremendous wisdom. You know, the archetype of Yoda is very strong and, and you'll see that archetype in every culture, every religion, you know? And so having a baby that wouldn't have any of that and what's the, the other extreme archetype, the pure, innocent, you know, new life, innocence and, and, and love. And so that all came just from basically thinking about what's the most fun choice to make here. Like he thinks he has to do that. And now he's faced with this dilemma. I'm this, this, you know, this scarred bounty hunter who seems to, doesn't even have a face. And you question, do they still have a soul? And then this renewal of this extreme innocence facing it and that it becomes, he is going to have to make decisions and change to engage with this beautiful thing. Uh, so that was, it all came from storytelling, but the surprise of not seeing Baby Yoda, of not seeing Grogu until the reveal at the end of the first episode of a new show on a new streaming service, I think was a very uh, important moment because everybody was like, eh, let me wait and see if I wanna watch the show. And then next yeah. thing you know, everybody's talking about this, like, what is that? And then <laughs> all of a sudden everybody's now wants to watch it when it first comes out so it's not spoiled for them. And that anything, you know, with television, that's the thing. You got to surprise people every week. And that's the tradition, honestly, of the, uh, you know, all the cliffhangers that inspired originally George Lucas was, you know, the serialized storytelling. I learned about Yoda in the theater. And I didn't even think that was Yoda. He was like looking for Yoda, like, who's this guy? And I remember being surprised. And Star Wars was always about being surprised. I don't want to spoil anything for people who haven't seen the old Star Wars movies, but... <laughs> There's a, a, a familial relationship between Luke and uh, Darth Vader that was revealed. So there was always surprises and revelations and, you know, a lot of gasps. In, in addition to the gasps about the scale of the spaceships and the excitement of right. the, the technology and the space battles and the lightsaber fights. So I like the half century later spoiler alert, just in case. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there might be somebody out there. Back in 77. Exactly. John, thanks so much. Great this talking such a blast. to you.
First of all, it's great to see you, Jeff. It's so great to see you. Wait a minute. The only the one of the oh. times I've seen you. Yes. Let's review. Sure. Let's have a drink. I think and only at the yes, please. Cheers. I think it cheers. I, now, is it incorrect to 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 toast to to, to plink water with water? It is. It's bad luck, as a matter of fact. So we'll have to bring out some hard liquor if yeah. you have it. But I say break the rules. You, Let's you, do it. June 9th is the 29th anniversary of the premiere of the first Jurassic Park movie. Is that true? 29 well, years ago in DC. Does that feel like a lifetime ago? Does that feel like yesterday? What's your sort of perspective on this Jurassic run? I'll tell you, when Laura Dern mentioned it to me the other day, I had forgotten. As I sit here, I can't really remember. It's the truth of it. <laughs> Washington, DC is distinct from anything else. I don't remember that we were there first. I don't know. It's kind of, anyway, it's, it must be a long time ago, or I'm going dim. Some bridges are... Well, no, you're forgiven. There were many premieres, I'm sure, to that movie, and it, it was a long time ago. It feels a long time ago and, and kind of recent, you know, and, and kind of recent. Um, and I, I don't know that it, it changed my life. Not, not like you'd think professionally, I guess, in retrospect, but... I don't have a recollection of feeling like, go golly, my life has changed. You know what I mean? With all that said, though, yes, Jeff, sir. what is it like to be back here now in, in this movie, something that was a long time ago, yeah. doesn't feel like it. What's it like to be sitting here back in the world of Jurassic? Uh, privileged. I feel lucky. I don't take it for granted. It certainly wouldn't have been predictable or expected 30 years ago. When I was a kid, I was hot about the idea of being an actor. And I knew it was a long sh shot to ever get to do it. Uh, so, and I'm still aware of that, the fact that I've gotten chances to keep doing it kind of not uncommonly, continually over now a longish period of time is I feel privileged and appreciative of it and to be in a movie that um, if nothing else kind of uh, you know, gets people's attention, entertains them, and means something to them uh, here and there. You know, it's awful fun. And to work with creative people. Now, that's the thing that I really did focus myself on. I was hot to not only be an actor, but to have this creative adventure. Mm. And I had a good teacher, Sandy Meisner, who said, you know, here's, here's a worthwhile way to spend your life. And you can keep getting better at it for, forever. Yeah. And so that's been important to, to me. And to be back with Laura, and to be back with Sam, back with that team, and conjuring such nostalgia for those of us who loved the first one, the seeing the three of you together, what was it like to walk on set with them? Uh, fantastic, fantastic, uh, great. You know, I'd been prepared in my mind for some months and been working on it. And then we contacted each other over the phone what do you, you know, how's this going to go and what can we do? And da, 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 da. Um, But yes, but then I saw them. We all, you know, we were the first production out in the bubble yeah. uh, caused by COVID. And Sam and Laura had found out when I was arriving and were there stationed on some little balcony and gave me a very sweet and crazy, um, uh, uh, you know, hello. And then uh, we embraced it. Was, it was great. And then the first day on the set, the three of us were there kind of improvising and doing things. And we showed up and she said that uh, Colin Trevorrow, our wonderful director, took a picture and she saw the crew and they were all kind of interested and a little bit, mm. you know, emotional and like that and made her emotional. And then he, Colin sent that picture to uh, Mr. the great Mr. Steven Spielberg who said back to him and he re related to us that he was emotional, you know. So it was, uh, it was emotional. I, what I remember from it was very sweet being with them. But what I remember is that it was a very focused kind of play time, you know, work mm -hmm. time, uh, to kind of get, get it right. So we went to work. You went to work, and you went to work well, and you stepped back into a story for people who are getting ready to go see this, where we now find the dinosaurs. I won't give too much away, but we're having to coexist and to live in the same spaces as dinosaurs. So what else should somebody who's going to go out and watch this know about where we find ourselves in well, Jurassic let's see. World? Yes, dinosaurs are all over the world, so it's kind of an epic in scope uh, little story that takes us all over the place. And, um, and the three of us don't have just little 
tidbits. Uh, you know, we're not just a garnish on a sweet platter, but you know, we have nice, nice little parts. So we're all over it if that interests anybody. And. Uh, <laughs> What, what else? It's a movie that you want to see in the movie theater because yes. it's uh, big and uh, loud. We're going to take our kids, as a matter of fact, for the first time to see a, a movie in a movie theater uh, this coming Sunday. Oh, their first ever movie yes. will be Dad's movie. Yes, that's never cool. never seen it. I mean, uh, yeah. Have you seen the movie? Have you sat and watched I've, it yet? I've, I've seen it twice. And I had a great experience. I'm not just selling it, but I was kind of very with it. And... Um, and on the edge of my seat, and there are a lot of jumps in it. The dinosaurs yeah. made me jump a bunch of times, you know, which is sort of enjoyable. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and the characters by that time, and now we've been immersed in spending time with each other doing this publicity. So I was very kind of talking about it. So I was very kind of immersed in the ca characters and uh, the dinosaurs, and I was even kind of choked up and mm. kind of, I was really with it, you know. So I loved it. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. From New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. It feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. West Homestead. Yeah, yeah. You, Have you ever been around Pittsburgh at Pittsburgh, all? yes. I don't think I've been to West Homestead. Yeah, you know, it's a little it's there, hamlet right. there, you yes, know, off in the, the suburbs. Yeah. It seems to me, reading everything I have read about you, you knew so young that you wanted to be an actor in a place that wasn't known for cranking out actors. Oh, you were writing in the fog of the mirror, yeah, 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 let, me let me be an actor, all that. Yeah, I was obsessed by it, but that was like in ninth, 10th grade when I took these couple of Carnegie Mellon uh, six week summer courses in acting. And that, that, then I was, you know. Obsessed. Where did that come from, that obsession? I think around 10 that happened. And it was that, you know, my dad had said, if you find something you love doing, uh, that might be a vocational guide, guide post. And, uh, and then I was in this camp that I loved, that was different than the kids that I went to school with, and I loved it, and came alive there. And there was a drama course there, and I jumped on stage, and afterwards they said, well, how'd you like that? They were there, my parents were there, and I went, yeah, I, yeah, I, I like that, you know, mm. but I kind of kept a secret to myself that that's, I wanted to do it. Wow. Yeah. It's right. thrilling, right? It's a collaborative thing. People clap for you after you do it. Yeah, clapping is okay. But yes, it was. I remember people laughing during this thing. I played this part, and and uh, yeah, it was thrilling. It was. I'll tell you, I was backstage. I remember being backstage in this chapel theater. It was a kind of nice, nice, nicey theater. I remember. I think even now, f thinking to myself, I, I'm not prepared to do this. There's nothing. I mean, I worked on a little bit. I don't know what I'm gonna do. How do I know what to do? And I, I had to actually leap on stage. Like, uh, and, you, you know, uh, and I took that leap, and I guess it was even spiritual and psychological mm. and metaphorical, uh, out of nothing that allowed me to have this thing and experience. And that still kind of means something to me now, this mm. sort of leap out of nothing that for any moment of life is the way to go, you know? Uh, I still am kind of thrilled and romantic about it. And you took a massive leap coming here to New York as a kid. You were still a kid, 17 years old. Yes. How did that conversation go with your parents? Well, <laughs> okay, actually, my dad was a doctor. Yeah. And um, 
And I had enrolled, I had um, applied to Carnegie Mellon University, who said, hey, he was good in the summer sessions, he should apply to the regular school. I did a bad audition, I think. I was not prepared. They turned me down, and I hadn't applied any place else. And my dad, I told you, he said, find something you love to do. I remember in ninth grade, when I, in the summer, when I came home, kind of all jazzed up and talking about what I'd learned, whether it was, uh, we were taking a mime course, believe it or not. And I was thrilled about a lot of, a lot of things. And he said to my mom in front of me, look at that, the, the kid is stimulated. Mm. And I remember the way he said it, I thought, oh, that's important to him. And uh, yes, I get, you know, it was important to me, it became important to me. So any, anyway, um, so anyway, he was okay and they were okay with it and supported it. And, uh, and then before long, I started to get jobs and, you know, make, make a, living at it, and there you go. That's You're here, you start finding jobs. You were great as Freak Number One in Death Wish, your first movie. Yes, <laughs> yes. Annie Hall and The Big Chill. Which movie felt to you like, this is my break? I'll tell you, in retrospect, I suppose we can say, well, it was good professionally, that was kind of a break. But not, nothing felt like the day after, or hey, I got my break, or, and I wasn't focused, I wasn't, my, that's not my sensibility, I wasn't going, I need a break, I need to break into, you know, get a break. I was continuing to learn, happy that, gee, I hope nobody finds out that I'm not an actor yet, because Sandy Meisner, the other side of the mm -hmm. coin of this nice idea he had, is I'm not really an actor yet. I'm just practicing and trying to become an actor. So I was happy to, and I think it was lucky that I got little chances to kind of see, see what I could do. So it was like that. But as we look at it now, yes, all those things kind of led to each other. And then the big chill in the 83 and da da da, -da. I did 10 Speed and Brown Shoe. Mm. Last time I saw Ben Vereen was in this room, believe it or not, Is where we were right? playing here. Yeah, yeah. Wow. He came, very wonderful guy. And, uh, you know, and then da 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 And then that's 83. Oh, The Fly, the fly. happens in 86, 87. Yeah. Is The Fly the one, though, where now I know who Jeff Goldblum is for sure? He's, Me I know or his other name. people? Or no, other, other people. people. Other people? No. <laughs> yeah, he's a... I hope you knew it before then. <laughs> he's a... I know what Jeff Goldblum is. He's a mon monster of sort. He's a half, a uh, heart, barely human. Uh, yes. Um, but well, that, the success of that movie obviously impacted the way people saw you. I, I, yes, I think so, and, uh, you know, professionally. But still, the main thing for me is that it was a creative landmark, and working with David Cronenberg, terrific. And on that material, gee, I had a juicy and gro growth-producing time of it. Uh, and then, yeah, yes, it, it, it was, it was uh, nice for me wasn't it? It maybe had led to other things. But even now, I don't know that I could connect the dots and say that led absolutely to that. If it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't, I, I don't know. It's tough, tough to measure. So after The Fly, about seven years later, comes the first Jurassic Park movie. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, you've got, there's obviously some work in between there. Yeah. But this is a next step. I mean, I know you downplay how it changed your life and all those things, and that's fair, and you don't think about the commercial success of it, but... Yeah, but it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jurassic Park is a very lucky thing. And uh, like I said, well, we've already talked about it, Steven Spielberg and the people with whom you work and doing this stuff. But yes, uh, people coming up to you, how the fans feel about it is nice, and that's a big deal. That's a sweet thing. And yeah, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a good, nice thing for an actor to, for me to have ha had, had gotten to do. That's true. Are you aware of the endurance of your line, life uh, finds a way? I like you it. still hear it? Life. Uh, finds a way. Isn't it funny to think you delivered it the way you thought it would sound right 30 years ago and here you're still seeing it on posts online and people saying it as they go about their lives. Yes, you know, it'll be forgotten soon enough and all this, <laughs> all our activities here will be fleeting and well, we'll turn to dust. Now well, we're getting real deep. Eventually. That's well, painfully true. We know yes. that. It's, a, yeah. it's, it's not, not a secret. But for now, fleetingly, eh, it's sweet that, you know, it's not entirely disposable and that 30 years, as quick as that really is and on the cosmic calendar, it's nice and interesting and crazy that, yeah, things pop up and, you know, you see things. That's, that's cute.
live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. People watch you from the outside, and I get to see you up close in a way most people don't. And it feels like you move through life with joy, absent of cynicism. You just sort of appreciate all the things that come through your life. Is that how it really is? Is the Jeff Goldblum we believe to exist the one who is? Well, I'm not pretending in any way, you know. Uh, I try to be authentic, even in my presentation here. Um, so, uh, y y y yes. So, yes. I mean, I have moments and d all different parts of me that can, uh, you know, get, get, you know, chew on some miserable bone, you know, that's fun to chew on for a second. Uh, but no, I, you know, I'm still a humble student. And however it happened, I'm lucky. My life with these kids and Emily, it seems to be full of uh, vitamin A and uh, possibility. But I still, yes, like to, I'm a student of and was listening today to some wisdom of one kind or another about how to be creative and live creatively mm. and how to live uh, uh, optimally. Is that the word sure. I want? You know, and that's a good question. And I'm still engaged in it and uh, trying to do today better than I did yesterday with leaping uh, into life and, 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 and appreciating it, being grateful for it and seeing what I can give to it uh, and what's here, uh, you know, uh, which will be gone soon enough uh, to appreciate. I think what's special about you as well is your curiosity and your presence. You do seem to, whoever you're with, you're in that moment. Or wherever you are, you are in that moment, in well, that space. That's the, I aspire to that. And, you know, my life studies uh, overlapped with my acting technology. Sandy Meisner was a good teacher. And, like all other good teachers, too, he had a particular... Um, a particularly effective and interesting way of teaching how to be in the moment. That's what actors talk about. That's the cliche. But but you, that, that's what you got to do because you're you're pretending. So like life, you have to infuse it with a little bit of uh, acceptance of the and receptiveness to spontaneity, and then creating the illusion of spontaneity. So you got to be entirely available to hear the other person's line, which you may know in part of yourself what it's going to be, but you've got to be particularly available and engaged in, besides the line, the deeply interesting, mysterious, infinitely fascinating uh, that is the other human mechanism, that is mm -hmm. that person over there. Because you're part of the cosmic, the Big Bang is in you. Mm. 
and I don't know everything about you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then you got to pretend moment to moment. That's the acting part <laughs> right. of it. But right. yeah, that's a little riff on me. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think there's infinite knowledge out there for us to grab onto and know and learn about. So you can't ever just sit back and not pursue it or at least be curious about it. Doctor, You're wasting time. your time. There's something about here on Earth. You know, we yes. live on a special that we can easily take for granted. Yes. We live as part of this movie, the Jurassic series. This Earth is pretty magnificent. And the other creatures with whom we share it are, forget dinosaurs, are various and magnificent and deserve our deserve equal safety and um, liberty as we have and uh, our uh, wonderful coexistence. Ah, I could talk about this all day with you. They're going to throw us out of here eventually, though. Um, before I ask you to uh, play a tune on the piano, if you don't mind, oh, sure. um, the reason we've had to see so much more of you lately is because of your reality show. A successful two seasons yes. with Jeff Goldblum. How much fun do you have with that? I did have fun, you know. I did have fun with that. Disney Plus, you could go see yeah. the 22 episodes. So I had a good time. Yeah, yeah, they were very good, and we made nice little You gonna keep doing it? Do another season of it? Or we don't know yet? We don't know yet. Yeah. I don't know what we're gonna do. There yeah. could be more, but I had a nice, uh, you know, belly full of uh, satisfying portion of it. 22 episodes, can you imagine? We went all over it. You know, it keeps, you, work. Yeah. keeps you busy. I know you've sure. got a, an extraordinary constitution. <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's an investment. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. NBC News, streaming free now. So how does music fit into your life then? You've played this room, by the way, many times. Not many times, no, for you one were, week. Oh, it was we only a week. We played for one uh, week. Okay. It was a special, it was a special uh, uh, week. It was uh, fun. And like acting, your love of jazz and your love of music goes all the way back to your childhood, doesn't it? Yeah, around 10 or so, I, I forget. My, we had, there were four of us kids. Our parents gave us lessons. My brother played the clarinet. I played uh, the piano. Was bad for the first couple of years. Didn't want to practice. You know, didn't know what discipline was like then. Doing your homework, you know. And then he gave me a jazzy piece, and I was like, I, I like this. Something about me that just kind of responded to syncopation and something like that. So I practiced and learned how to play that. And then around that time, I had my heart set on acting as a career. But I got it into my head to, because I didn't have summer jobs or anything like that. Um, to get the telephone boy, the yellow pages, and look at cocktail lounges around Pittsburgh, I was 15, and go and call up, cold call them, and say, uh, you know, I hear you're looking for a piano player. I started to do that, and in the same vein, I kind of kept a piano with me. I did Broadway, you know, Broadway musical or two, and was down in the pit playing with the musicians. I just loved it, loved musicians, and put it in a movie or two. There's a, my character in the fly plays yeah. for a second. Yeah. And then about 30 years ago, Somebody said, uh, it was Peter Weller, in fact, who said, come on, let's play out and about. And, uh, you know, have a little band. And the, a core band, kind of, I ca I've kept it up whenever I'm not working. And we made a couple of albums and yeah. this and that. And, you know, we wound up playing. So it's a part of my life and, uh, which is very fun, unexpected, non-careerist oriented. But my daily life includes, before the kids get up, usually, always, I work out in the gym and do my little workload of piano. That changes my day, changes my life. Music is a tonic, mm. as you know. 
And uh, it's uh, great. Thank, thank you to Shirley once again mm. and Harold for giving me piano lessons. All kinds of gifts from your parents. That's correct. Truly. Yeah, that's correct. Great. All right, should we play a little music? Do you take requests when you go to a party? You sit down at the piano and people say, Jeff, please play this. Or do you say, here's my set list? No. <laughs> what I like to do is go through, I, I like to cold read. I like to, um, uh, a lead sheet, you know, jazz yeah. players. So I go through the fake books. I like to play anything like that. Oh, I was, I like New York in June. Do you know that song? Mm-hmm. Uh, how about you? I like... A John Williams tune, etc., mm. etc. Et How about the Jurassic themes? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, go. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all. That's all. That's all. What is it like, Jeff, to play a room like this at the Carlisle? Sweet. You know, recently we played the Disney Concert Hall. Believe it or not, two thousand seat. Wow thing and we did that in Houston and Washington which is very nice but uh, it's 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 particularly um, delightful to play a nice room like this and this particular room with this history and lovely you know ambiance and uh, it's great have you been here a lot to see people I've uh, not a lot but a few times I have it's the intimacy I mean this is people can't see at home but it is a tight room it's, it's that's tight great. it's a little room and I yeah. like to talk to people and you know and uh, so it's uh, nice yeah what do you get from playing music, Jeff, that you don't get from all the other interests in your life? Well, well, um, uh, you know, it's overlapping. It's all overlapping. Life itself is musical, and at its best, it's kind of musical, you know, and uh, vibrational, you know, even, and pulse-driven, pulse and, mm. you know, uh, breathing in and out. And, of course, it's um, like we talked about a conversation and a collaboration and a connection to yourself and musically there are parts of yourself that can only be accessed uh, uh, through it, mm. through, through music I think and then you reach other people uniquely through music and like I say a conversation when you're playing with jazz guys particularly for me they do something unexpected and it makes you if you're listening and connected to it makes you do something in response hmm. response to it etc and that's overlapping in acting as we talked about and in life but what does it give me that I don't get otherwise well I have no I've told you I'm kind of non-careerist yeah. as I like to say um, about acting but I still, you know, want to put my best foot forward, and it's still my well, livelihood. You know, this I kind of uh, is just for fun. I really don't have to try too hard to just have fun without concern for just for its own sake. What will you sit down and play in the in the morning? Let's say you've just had your personal time in front of the piano. I would tell you, I, I'm not going to bore you with that. But I run through. I run. Th I don't need any music now for it. I run through my whole. Thing. I start with these days. I run through that song and then about 40 other songs, some of which I sing along with. And, blah, 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 blah. and then I finally get to our second, the bulk of what we did on this last album. So, for instance, this is from that album. making up this variation etc etc you know it's like jazz. That. Make it up as you go. It's a little, a little bit. bit of jazz. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sort of making that up. How I approach jazz, how jazz, I'm trying to learn how jazz, good jazz people approach it, is um, I may have a vision or an idea of, and a sensibility and a taste circle that I'd like to hit, and a kind of an idea, and people I, I love, and, you know, parts that I'd uh, like, but really, you see how the waves come in, uh, just like in jazz, and you uh, surf them, you know, <laughs> and see, see how you can navigate them. You don't get to pick what the wave's doing. You just have to figure out how to ride it.
Right? You said it much better than I did, <laughs> unsurprisingly. <laughs> I was summarizing. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> You're a great, what a great. Pleasure. What a pleasure. Man, my pleasure so entirely. Fun. Good thank to see you. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for making it all the way out here. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having us. Ten years, that's no joke. Happy 10th birthday. Thank you, thank you. When I say 10 years, yes. what does that sound like to you? It sounds like not very long when you have children, <laughs> right? Because you think of that like 10-year-old kid and or yourself as a 10-year-old. But when you're an entrepreneur, 10 feels <laughs> like a hundred years. <laughs> it's like dog days, man. You're like, oh, every day feels so long. It's, uh, it's cool though. I learned a lot about myself in this process, on this journey. Every day is different. Every day I'm learning. Every day I'm uncomfortable, but I do, I do love where we are today and what we've been able to accomplish. And you know, when we started 10 years ago, Consumers, everyday people didn't know that they could take their health into their own hands. They didn't know that they could demand more from companies. They didn't know that, you know, there can be ethics and standards that they live by applied to businesses that they decide to spend their hard earned money on. And that is something that I'm really proud of. You have to care about the planet and you have to think about how your ingredients or your products affect human health. What were you seeing out there that made you think we've got to change this? So when I became a mom and I was pregnant, I used products that my mother recommended for me to use and I had an allergic reaction myself and it just really made me think through health and wellness differently. I grew up very sick as a kid. I think it's why I became an actor when I was young because mm. I spent a lot of time alone and in hospital rooms and I had complications with asthma and allergies, terrible. And so I was just thinking about as I was becoming a new mom and I was like, I gotta keep this little person alive and I just want her to be happy and healthy. Like there's really nothing else that matters. And I was afraid that she could have an allergic reaction. What could I do for her? What if her throat was closing and she's an infant? She couldn't even tell me because she's a baby. And I was terrified about that possibility. And so I did research and I learned about harmful chemicals, toxic chemicals that are in everyday products. And so I lobbied on Capitol Hill for chemical reform a couple of times. And I just realized that human health was really politicized in this country. And so I was like, all right, well, I guess I can create the solution and I spent, you know, so much of my life selling movies and, you know, different products for different companies. And so I felt I knew how to reach the consumer in a genuine way. And so that's really where my mission and purpose came from, to create a company that has safety at the heart of it, around health and wellness, and thinks about the planet and people. And so I didn't have a business degree. I was super insecure. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I had to really like believe in myself first. And that's been a journey. I've had imposter syndrome and I've felt unworthy and all those things. But at the end of the day, what keeps me moving is when people say, by having honest in our home, you've made my life better. It's such a leap to say, okay, so there's something wrong here. A lot of us have that somewhere in our lives and say, I'm gonna be the one to do something about it. How did you have the guts to, to make that leap and to say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the one? Well, two things. One, there's no nepotism for me in entertainment. So no one was rolling out the red carpet for me to be a successful <laughs> actress. In fact, everyone was like, yeah, right. <laughs> Good luck with that one. And so I think the fact that I figured out how to make a career for myself in entertainment when there was nobody that looked like me, and frankly, I didn't really 
ever play into the stigmas or the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And so I was really kind of rebellious in my spirit and how I wanted to show up as an actress. And I think that same rebellious spirit is what I brought to the table when I was thinking about how I was going to get this done and create this company. It just made sense. It just felt like I can't believe there isn't a company that that's called The Honest Company and, and that stands for these values. Is it a hard decision, though, to walk away, at least temporarily? Of course, you're still acting, but yeah, to say, this I is going to be I, my focus now? It was my focus. You know, what's interesting is, like, first of all, I think because I didn't grow up with a lot, I was never really that flashing. I wasn't um, overspending. <laughs> I was really quite conservative, so I felt comfortable with my financial situation. So I felt comfortable to pursue what I believed was my purpose. I was like, when I had my baby, she really shifted my, the context of my life yeah. and my priorities. And I really just thought about my life choices and purpose and legacy differently. And I couldn't do anything else. I guess the drive was so intense mm -hmm. and so real. Here you talk about your insecurities and your imposter syndrome, which we all have all the time, of course. But you know that there are people who are like, oh, she's a movie star. What does she know about this? How is she going to run a company? Yeah, there's all, a lot of that. All of those things. <laughs> all of those things. And you, you heard all those things. Uh, yeah, I did. Did it get to you at any point? Or were you so focused on this that you just sure. shut it out? Of course it does. I think a lot of the naysayers, they drove me in a way. It was almost like putting fuel on, on the fire. And also like when you come from people having zero expectations of who you could be, there's a fearlessness. You can only kind of go up from there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So the, the growth of the company over time is, was huge, right? I mean, like you went from, okay, here's a spark in, of an idea. Mm -hmm. People responded very quickly. Mm -hmm. How did you guys sort of manage the pace of growth and success that I mean, you were experiencing. That's, yeah, that's sort of the learning, right? It's it's learning what is a healthy pace of growth and it's this game, right? Of you st staying true to who you are and, and what you believe in. It's a really difficult lesson to learn when you're in it, but once you're out the other side, I think that's why I'm so passionate about mentoring uh, other entrepreneurs, especially women, then I think trusting your gut on what to do. And then the harder part actually for me is then aligning a team around me that feels the same way. And it feels like too, you're talking about the ups and downs of the 10 years. You can't get complacent, right? You no. can't say we figured it out. You're never comfortable. We cracked the code. No, there's no cracking of the code. It's almost like every challenge which now I look at as lesson is really there to prepare you for the next stage. And if you can just, I guess, sort of welcome them as lessons instead of them sort of like weighing you down, then those are the entrepreneurs that you see them. You see them, you know, there's last man standing. They figure it out, they go with the flow, their business models change, they are malleable. Um, they're relevant. Talk about being a mentor to other women and Latina women who are mm -hmm. starting companies. Who were those people for you on the front side in 2011 and when all this was incubating? I'm not someone who speaks to strangers in the elevator. Like I'm a naturally kind of shy person and I have learned how to be a public facing person. Um, I play characters because I like to be somebody else. Yeah, I had to learn how to get out of my comfort zone and reach out to people, and I did. So I would reach out to pretty much any woman I would meet, even like when I would do sales meetings and meet executives um, in retail and in other places, go to conferences, and if I connected with someone, I would just say, can I call you? Mm. <laughs> and then I would, and I would say, have you ever dealt with this or that? Because I guess no one really tells you what you're gonna end up facing and where the challenges are really going to lie and you know you can have a great idea getting people behind that idea is the hard part were there crazy pinch me moments along the way i'm thinking of for example when you were on the cover of forbes magazine mm -hmm. <laughs> it was pretty wild <laughs> getting people to be aware of something that was so important to me 
that this message is spread and that people know that they can, more importantly, companies have to do better and that people can demand more, that was sort of like the validation that this idea is really for everyone. You went public a year ago. Happy one year anniversary of that. Thank you. How amazing was that to stand at the NASDAQ that day? It's still surreal to think about that. You know, so few women ever even get a chance at being there and being in that space and in that environment. I want all women out there to know that there's plenty of room at this table. It's crazy. Just having you know women and then even less when you think of women of color. So, yeah. yeah, it's just there's so few of us. So it is wild when you get a chance to be there and I guess have even more conviction around just how necessary it is to make space for others and just to make sure that that door that you pushed open never closes. What would you say to somebody who wants to chase the idea but is trying to kind of summon the courage to do it? You just have to, and I think instead of being discouraged by feedback, you have to be relentless, and you're only going through that challenge to make you better so that you can hone in on your idea. It's worth the leap. Take a shot. Yeah, you have to. For women, we are half the population. We have half of the ideas. We make all the buying decisions, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them. Why are we still left out of the business world? And there's a lot of group think. Nothing good comes out of that. Mm. <laughs> no good ideas. Right. It's only the, the ones that are provocative and polarizing that actually change the world. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? So this is the room where it happens, huh? You know, a lot of thinking happens in here. I like more of a community, so we have a ta I have a table there, and then, um, yeah, we can share screen and still do all of the, like, business updates and things, but uh, it's more flexible kind of space. That was the first thing I noticed. There's no big desk. Like, the CEO sits here. Yeah, it's no. It's like, come on in, sit down. Yeah, my CEO has a desk, but I'm, you know. <laughs> the I boss. I, You're the boss. <laughs> you know. And to think of how far you've come in those 10 years. My goodness. From an idea that some people might have thought was crazy. So many people. So <laughs> many people thought was really nuts um, for like a good three years until I convinced somebody to invest some money <laughs> into the idea. Yeah. And then that was cool. You stayed with it. And look at you now. I did. All right. Should we walk around? Yeah. Let's, right. uh, let's walk around. I like the sort of open vibe in here, too. It's not yeah. like the closed cubicle. It's People yeah. collaborating in open space. It is. You get a lot more done when you don't have to like set up formal meetings, and yeah. you can just overhear conversations, and um, it's much more like I think modern. Yeah. That like community. Yes. Do you want to see the labs? Can this we go is like in there? one of the, I think the things that make oh, wow. us really special because we have such a stringent quality and safety standard, the honest standard. We. Um, 
really, it's kind of like the base of, of what we do and who we are. So having labs where we could actually formulate is incredible and it's also where I get to have fun and be creative. <laughs> Hi ladies. Hi guys, how are you? Mind if we poke our heads in? Yeah, come on in. How's it going? So this is fun. We have... Um, I'm Willie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi. Hello. Hi, how are you? So this is cool. So this is how when you're going to do a color for a lip, you really have to like mush all the ingredients together or else there's like lumps and you don't really right. know like what color it will be. So whenever we're coming up with a new color, we can even do custom colors in here. And then this will be sort of the base that we work from, and then we'll send to our lab to make it at scale. Okay. But um, I get to play in here and like create colors, and it's really cool. That's so fun. And like even my kids can come in and create their own lotions or shampoos with their own scents, and yeah. It's fun to come see mom at work. Yeah, and also like I want them to be excited about science yeah. and chemistry, and what's cooler than having the coolest chemist? Then to so inspire cool. two young girls. <laughs> we'll let All you right. work. Thank you, yeah. guys. Nice to meet you both. All right. This is the infamous diaper wall. It's so <laughs> random. I don't know. There's something kind of cool about just the idea that we have a wall with like all of our prints. These, and oh my it, gosh. you know, we made over the years so many that it's not come around to here. That's amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, it also reminds me of like where I was at in my life <laughs> for really? the last 10 years. <laughs> right. Each print, you know, represents different stages of life. So this wasn't here. Okay. These were all solid floors. Uh, and so this is what I had it. to, yeah, gotcha. build out with the architect. And, you know, I was like, I want it to be warm. Is it cool of you to think there's a mother somewhere right now changing their baby's diaper, or that one, or that one, or that yeah. one. I mean, the things you guys think of in these rooms. I love going it. To people's homes. Yeah, I mean, even like, we wanted to have real people and their um, children on our packaging. So these aren't from photo shoots. These are from real people who take these pictures of their babies in these like most special intimate moments at home. And that's what we put on our packaging. It just feels more natural, more authentic, yeah, right. and, and that's like a friend that works here, that's her best friend, so I do like to do a lot of friends and family. Yeah, yeah. Um, they must be so proud of you, your family, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, this it's is a big pretty deal. cool. We don't test on animals, we test on human uh, beings, yeah. and they're usually related to me. Mostly family members. <laughs> Mostly right. family members. <laughs> so when I got this space, there were no doors here, and this was all air conditioning units, and this was supposed to be a wall. And I was like, well, I really think it's important to have the indoor-outdoor vibes. I think it just makes for a happier environment yeah. for people. So really homey vibes inside. And then even out here, we have plugs. Uh, we have great Wi-Fi. We have plants. Um, people have lunch out here. And it's just like a nice sort of break from the day. So when you look out over the horizon yeah. for your company, what do you see? What's out there in the future? What else do you want to do with it? We have a lot of growing to do and learning and changing and challenging. I think, you know, our biggest competition is ourselves. And we're just always trying to push the envelope to do better. And that's what I'm hoping we stay inspired to do that. You're doing it. So. Cool. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Now, tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. You were still in Kiev. Could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? 
These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You were talking about your childhood, and I didn't realize until I was reading more deeply about you before this, like everything you went through as a kid that kind of colors your perception of what you do here. Mm -hmm. um, not only were you moving around a bunch because mm -hmm. your dad was in the military, mm -hmm. but as you said, you were in the hospital all the yeah. time. I don't think most people fully appreciate what that was like for you. Yeah, I was a loner and had more interactions with adults just because, you know, the nurses or whatever. Mm. Yeah, I was probably kind of precocious as well because I didn't have the same ideas about myself or my place in the world as other kids because I didn't have a conventional kind of upbringing. Yeah, I felt very alien mm. in many environments. And I think that's why when I did make it on a set when I was 12, we were all eccentric and, you know, everyone was sort of like, diagonal. No one was on the straight and narrow. And no one cared about fitting in. You found your people. I found my people. Yeah, <laughs> but your family had entertainers as well. They were right? performers, but um, my grandfather was a bookkeeper, accountant for a big corporation. You know, so he had a pretty traditional sort of job, but he played beautiful Spanish classical guitar and he sang and danced on stage with my grandmother. We have like a very artistic family, but no one had done it as a career. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. How do you make that step from this is a thing we do as a family, and I'm pretty good at it, actually, and I like doing it, I too. wasn't good at it. No, I was the least talented. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. No, I was, I was shy, too. Yeah, I wouldn't even put myself out there. I dreamt about it a lot. I mean, I love movies. I would play out as if I were each character, all the characters and I would put myself in their shoes and escape from my life, you know? And once you got going, you really got going. When James Cameron put you front and center mm -hmm. in a network series at 17 years yeah. old, mm -hmm. that's a lot. You had to carry the series. He was series. like, Ace, <laughs> they think you're going to get your ass handed to you. He's like, these guys, they think that you're not going to be able to like deal with the pressure, deal with the long hours, do your own stunts. He's like, what do you say to that? And I was like, Tell them to go screw themselves. <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> and he was like, that's right. I believe in you, Ace. And he would always call me Ace. That was his motivational speech. Yeah, I think also, like, they were probably like, the 17-year-old girl came from who? Came from mm -hmm. where? Like, right. what if she, like, falls apart? Like, there's a lot riding on this. And it was a big show at the time. And it was expensive. I wasn't allowed to have a sick day. I remember I had pneumonia or the flu or something something that gave made me so sick that I couldn't get out of bed and the producer came over and he was like I came to get you because insurance and I puked on his feet um, <laughs> I crawled to the door I opened the door and I barfed on his feet and I was like I can't yeah I mean that's how tough it was I was in every scene and it was long days and, and long you're a hours kid. and I was a kid yeah. and I don't know any kid that would had that work ethic and so it taught me actually a lot. It was one of my greatest lessons just on like showing up and yes. hard work. I was like the first to get there and the last to leave. So what's the role where your life really changes? Is it honey? Is it Dark like, Angel okay. did well, Dark really Angel. changed my yeah. life. And then maybe the Fantastic Four yeah. series because first of all there weren't very many female superheroes yeah. and I was Latina and playing an iconic character. Um, and Stanley says that was his favorite character. Oh, really? Yeah, he loved her. That's probably a turning point for me because I got to sort of like 
capitalize on the global audience that I had built with Dark Angel and lean in on that for the big screen. Mm. And so it really kind of like took it to that next level. As you say, as someone who didn't grow up in like a showbiz family, how did you handle the fame side of it? I think it's hard. I don't know if anyone could ever really be prepared for it. Um, living in a fishbowl. When I had my kids, I didn't want them to carry the anxiety mm. that comes with that. I mean, I lied to them and I told them that everybody gets followed by strangers. And it wasn't until like my daughter was like in second grade <laughs> that she realized that it, uh, she was like, mom, why are you on the cover of a magazine? She, she was like, it was it. so embarrassing. <laughs> Someone like brought it to school. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, why, why? It's, why are you doing this? And I was like, oh. <laughs> Cat's out of the bag. Yeah. But she wasn't, I don't think she really realized that honest wasn't my only job. Right. Because I never exposed them to it. Right. I don't like have pictures of myself around and I don't talk about it. And so they lived a pretty kind of like sheltered-ish life yeah. about it. And do you, you guys, you and Cash, it seems like have worked hard to sort of keep that as normal as it can be. As normal as it can be. It's not normal, it's no. weird. And I try to talk to my kids about like how fortunate we are. Um, and there are so many people who, you know, are struggling and and how grateful they need to be for their life. So then they don't get too caught up in any of it, either feeling sorry for themselves because they live in a fishbowl, and then on the flip side, just being grateful for their life so they can just be kind and generous people. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. So as you move forward, how are you going to look at this balance that you've struck the last 10 years of honest and your acting career. You've got some stuff booked that's coming up, also yeah. executive producer of a new yeah. series on Netflix. How are you looking at that? Producing is something that I've always wanted to do, and I think more doing more behind the camera is really exciting as well. And then I feel like I just barely scratched the surface from a creative standpoint for myself as an actress. I kind of just wanted the check to clear, to be honest. I was pretty mm. transactional with Hollywood. I was like, will it pay? Is it going to be a global thing? Is it going to keep me in this sort of like relevant space for a global audience? But it wasn't me fulfilling my creative kind of needs. So now I'm like, I have a lot more confidence as well. I was really insecure. And I think mm -hmm. I kept it pretty surface because I was like, you know, I'm just going to hit my mark and I'm going to show up on time and right. I'm going to be professional and I, it's going to fulfill this purpose. But now I'm, you know, I'm excited about exploring more in Hollywood and entertainment and telling stories and there's so many different platforms now so there's a lot less, I think, weight on uh, your opening weekend like it used to be. Right. I love how many women get to be, you know, behind the camera, in front of the camera telling stories and the diversity of the streamers and, and where content can be made and 
it's it's awesome. It's interesting. You almost can kind of like relaunch yourself. Like you've been doing this for ten years, and here she comes back to Hollywood, and she's directing or producing or taking yeah. on new kinds of roles. So yeah, it's exciting. I mean, after COVID, man, I'm very grateful to be here. Yeah, and not like it's gone away, but I think just reflecting on the last couple of years, if we get to wake up and and be here then let's do everything we can to make it joy, just pure joy <laughs> and fun and happiness. Amen you know. to that. Yeah. Well, thank you for hosting us. Congrats on 10 years. Thank you. Here's to many, many more. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks for doing this. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for hosting us I'm in your spot. I'm thrilled that you're all out here in our little store. What is it like to be sitting in a brick and mortar store surrounded by sort of the universe you've created? So much of what you've done is online, obviously, but yeah. to sort of see it all in front of you and have people come in and look and touch and feel. You know, I, I always find it surreal a little bit when I come into a store. And I think even more so now in a post-COVID landscape because our stores were closed for so long. It's so nice to actually, I don't know, come back into a physical space and see customers. And it's such a place of discovery for people. And everybody's always smiling when they're in the store. So I, I love coming into the store. That's a good sign. Is there <laughs> one place when they come in later today, they'll go 